What's up, everybody? I'm Jeremy, and you're watching Warples Morse. I hope you guys maybe noticed the new look. We've got, we're now technically using StreamYard's paid uh, version. So now we've got Nathan up here from Inf Infinite Possible Pythons. He is our newest sponsor of the channel. Let me uh, do something here real quick. I want to thank Nathan for sponsoring this week's episode with Bob of Bob's uh, Falls. And I also want to thank my buddy Chris from BNS Reptilia, which we'll run his little commercial a little bit later on in the video. But I want to, you know, just take a minute here to thank Chris and Nathan, or yeah, Chris and Nathan for sponsoring this week's live because 2023, it's going to be an amazing year, folks. I promise you that. So uh, let me put this stuff back up here and let's bring out Bob. Mr. Hey, Drew, what's going on? What's going on? Not much, dude. How you doing? I am good. I just got back from watching Avatar, actually, with my wife. Oh, okay, okay. What'd you think of it? Uh, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it a lot. Um, after waiting a decade to watch it, uh, I, we, we enjoyed <laughs> it. And I honestly thought my wife was going to fall asleep about 20 minutes into the movie. It's a long movie, and she always falls asleep during movies. And she actually watched the whole thing, so I was, uh, I was actually very surprised. But we nice. didn't wait till uh, today to watch it because it's been packed. We couldn't get like, anytime we looked at it, the seats were bad. Like you have the book seats ahead of time here. And the seats oh, were just okay. terrible every time we, we look for seats. And it's always sold out. And finally, this is a week is kind of uh, kind of empty. See that? My son and I went to go see that, what was it, two weeks ago maybe? No, a week ago. Anyway, we went to go see it. Uh, didn't have any issues getting getting seats. But we also went during like middle of the week during the middle of the day. Right, right. But I freaking loved it, dude. Like you said, waited 10 years for this movie to right. come out. Um, it was funny at the end, he go, we were walking out. He goes, Dad, I almost cried at the end of this. I looked at him, I was like, Yeah, well, once you become a parent, those some of those moments get a little bit more tear jerky too, dude. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was a tear jerking movie, like the like a lot of tear jerker moments. Yes, it was. I loved it though. Um I don't want to spoil it for anybody, but everybody actually I got to talk about this, I think, on the last live too. But everybody go see it. If you've seen the first one, you gotta go see the second one. Yeah. You won't regret it. So let's say hi to a couple people here, real quick. Nathan, what's up, brother? Thank you for sponsoring this week's episode. We got Will from Will's Hella Heat. What's up, Will? Kike, thanks you for all the love and support, bro. Greatly appreciate it. Ledco, what's going on? Thanks for tuning in. Scooters, what's up? Thanks for tuning in. Eric, what's going on? Jolly, thanks for tuning in. Rob, what's up? Thank you for tuning in. Joe, hopefully you got my text message. Um, definitely, I will be sending you over the new commercial for the uh, expo here. I'll work on that this week. I've got Monday, Tuesday, and I think I might be working Wednesday yet. We'll have to see, and then I'm going to be on layoff. So uh, I'm going to definitely get the uh, commercial completely ironed out and send that over and let you see it for your stamp of approval. Sean, Pie and Joy, what's going on, Sean? Thanks for tuning in. Kent, what's going on? Beast Morse, thanks for tuning in. Dude, I will be sending you a uh, message here at some point about coming on the live stream as well this year. Um, Nathan, I did not have to do makeup. I have that pre-done, dude uh phil what's going on thanks for tuning in straight blast what's up brandon what's going on tammy thanks for tuning in ken what's up thanks for tuning in 905 what's going on patrick you are everywhere brother thank you for all the support Lindsay, thanks for tuning in uh we got chris from balls deep he's another one of my pa breeder buddies thanks for tuning in chris John and Christine, what's up? Thanks for tuning in. Hirsch Captive Bread Ball Pythons. Joel, thank you for tuning in. Lots of new faces in here, or some of these new faces. Earns Exotics, thanks for tuning in. So that kind of catches us up. Um, all right, Bob, let's get to talking about you, dude. Tell us how you got into the hobby and industry. Um, I've been in this industry for a little bit now, I guess. Hey, Lindsay's, Lindsay's in here. We're um, Fanny Pack. Uh, uh, twins, but um, <laughs> where I got into this industry, I, I want to say I got like actually deep, deep into the industry in 2013. 
Bubble. Okay. That I um I I bred leopard geckos uh, when I was in uh, college, and uh, I hatched my first clutch of ball pythons in two thousand and nine, and kind of just like dabbled here and there. I had a rat rack in my at my parents' house. Um, I built snake very rinky dink snake racks when I was first uh, I was in college, and pretty much if you thought about building a, a snake rack out of this material i've probably done it i've done wood melamin um pvc i've done i've used it all i thought about metal sheets i've done i've tried it all i failed at it all and now we just call ars and order our racks because i realize how much money i waste um you know keep messing up racks and i'm like let's just call the professional and have have them yep. do it um but in 2013 I started selling insurance and actually making some real money. So I, um, I actually uh, invested more. I bought my first project, which at the time uh, I bought my first pied. I bought a spider pied male and two het, pet pied females. Okay. And um, and I I really, I, I never imagined any of this, you know, ever. Um, I, I just thought, yeah, hey, I'm just going to buy a few animals and make some cool stuff. Because I had gone to the Daytona um, Breeders Expo few years before that and I was watching guys sell bumblebees you know for $1,200 and stuff like that so I bought a spider pied male and two het females and that was like my big first big investment um and then uh it's literally just been non-stop I was having snakes shipped to my insurance office uh every Wednesday Thursday I'm having packages come in and I'll ship out of there and uh, when I met my wife, I told her I had a, I had some animals and I showed her 100, 100 snakes. And she was like, do you sell these things? And I'm like, no, I just I just breed and I, I keep everything. And I, I did. I hoarded everything. It was a female is going to go into the hold back rack. And that was my idea at the time. As I was going to build this army of snakes. Um, and then in 2016, I quit my day job and and uh, have been breeding snakes for a living ever since. And it's been a blessing. And um, the community has been more supportive than I can ever ask for. Uh, we've had our ups and downs in the community, you know, with different breeders or whatever. But honestly, I've, I've never, uh, I've probably met 10 times more um, passionate and good people than I've met, you know, the crappy um, BS breeders. There are just so many good people in this industry that uh, we try not to let the crappy ones, you know, get us down. And it's been, it's been yeah. a blessing. Now, all right. You and I were talking backstage about some controversial things. We're not going to talk about the one yet, but you brought up one that is a very controversial thing. And that's spider. What's your thoughts on it? Because I personally love spider. I, that's one gene I want to see make the biggest comeback in the world. What's your thoughts on it? um i love spiders because uh a spider ball python was my third morph i bought i bought a pastel then i bought a mojave then i bought a spider i drove um i drove from georgia to tampa to pick up a spider ball python female from a guy out of his garage i paid 350 dollars for a hatchling spider female okay. and um i love the mutation i love everything they did at the time um even with the wobble let's let's pretend the spider doesn't wobble like let's just let's just pretend the spider is a non-neurological it doesn't have any issues it's, it's just a great pattern changer yeah the problem for me with spiders is that and, and again i breed spiders and I've, I've produced spiders we're cutting down a lot of the spiders right now and beast morphs correct spiders always eat and always breed if you buy a male spider breeding uh, combo as a breeder, he's going to breed. And he'll breed all your females. And if you buy a female spider, she's going to lay eggs every year. It's just, it's amazing mutation. However, we take away all the wobble. We take away all the YouTube um, lander and stuff on the mutation. The problem with the mutation itself, and I'm sorry for anybody that has like half their collection spiders, okay? <laughs> um, here, here is the, uh, the, the in insider of the spider is that uh, again spiders destroy pattern right like like it says it destroys pattern in a in pied you can't use spider because 99 percent of the, the the animal will be white so yeah. now you can't do a lot of combos with spider a lot of people will tell me well if you add in cheat i'm like look man if you have to add in cheat to fix it it's kind of a problem already so 
in Pied, it already is, is destroys that and you can't really use it much. Okay, so that's a problem. Now in Clown, which is the other most important gene in the ball python industry, in my opinion, is um, it reduces all the pattern down. And you'll notice now in the in today's world, everybody wants their clowns a little bit busier and more yeah. potential to add new genes. Once you add spider to it, it reduces the pattern down so much that it's hard to see the other genes. I mean, even if you had like a mahogany, you had a mahogany stranger DG spider clown. It will probably look like a spider DG clown. It will be so reduced that, and then you're going to end up having to sell that animal at half price because it, it, it carries spider and you can't see the other genes. Um, so that is where my hesitation of spider comes in, um, in using it a lot. Uh, in clown, you for those that are working clown heavy, you're going to want a lot of heavy pattern animals. That's why Spot Nose and Black Pastel did so well uh, in clown uh, over the over its long run. Uh, you're watching more breeders shy away from way too reduce, right? And there was one point in time when Blade came out, and it was the biggest thing. Everyone wants Blade Clown, Blade Clown, Blade Clown. And then now you're watching more breeders shy away from Blade Clowns and Super Blade Clowns because a Super Blade Clown is going to remove all that that beautiful pattern that you get from Black Pastel and Spot Nose. I see it kind of does pulls the spider effect and starts trimming stuff off. Right, right. So... That's where I stand on spider. I, I I don't hate the gene. I don't hate that it wobbles or anything like that. I think the wobble thing can be minimized. Uh, most of my spiders don't wobble that bad. I have one that's a pet that wobbles pretty bad. But other than that, the animal itself eats and breeds. So they're great animals. But the mutation itself is just, in my opinion, is too strong. I see it's kind of, it has its place. I'll put it that way. Um, I do agree with you 100%. You know, it does start trimming off a lot of stuff. Um, the, fortunately, all of my spider stuff, it doesn't have any wobble or anything that is, is very significantly noticeable. Um, I personally work heavy in like Exantic stuff. Or I'm, Exantic's my big project. Right. So spider, you know, everybody loves the zebra bees. So spider's a big part of that project for me. Right. But I, I, like you said, I mean, if it wasn't for that whole wobble thing i th it would be an amazing gene in the right projects i actually one of my uh only breeder spider females left is actually a spinner blast double head dg azanthic because i think spiders saying spiders antics are beautiful animals um, they so are, that's, dude. that's one of the girls i just couldn't sell <laughs> now are you ever gonna sell her or you think you're gonna hold on to her just for the pure eye candy purpose um she looks great but again it once i produce the visual like if i produce a spinner blast dg azanthic i don't even know if i'll like that or not um oh, but okay. once i produce that I, i'll probably re replace her um but who knows I, I always say yeah i'll probably keep this animal for a while and then i'll i'll make five replacements and i got to get rid of them at some point you, know? <laughs> you gotta kind of trim the fat off and everything right right can you, Hadley, can you go back upstairs, baby? Uh, love you. <laughs> my daughter, my wife and daughter just came home, and Hadley always loves to come down and say goodnight to me. <laughs> so yeah. now she's saying that she's got to go upstairs. Yeah, meet that, man. She's daddy's little princess, and she's just, she loves, dude. That is one little girl that loves to be down in the snake room. She is going, I'm, a firm believer she's going to be the one that takes over this whole thing once i'm done and over and everything good um, that's good i mean it's always good to teach children to respect first of all respect the species and the animals and then to enjoy you know what we do but yeah. as antics man you're 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 in you're in the right corner i hear a lot of people tell me as antics dead and then all of a sudden, everyone and their mom wants Xanthic combos. And, uh, you know, Xanthic Desert Ghost is like my baby. I, I love that project. Uh, Xanthic Clowns is a beautiful project. Xanthic Pied is a beautiful project. I mean, you can't go wrong with it. Dude, this this season, all right, it will it will be my first, it'll be my third season, my first shot at making any visual recessives at all. Um, my very first uh, season, I produced double... Uh, double hat exantic clowns so this year i have my first shot at hitting a double visual recessive right. on top of that same male that i because i have a uh, i produce a bumblebee that's double head exantic clown i paired him back to his mom this season so that way now i can have possibly hit the visual exantics 
and have everything else be 50% head clown as well. So I'm trying to, you know, I'm trying to get that all going. I had two other exantic girls. One is, um, she's a pastel exantic. She was paired to my desert ghost male. She's due to lay like she's she's gonna lay like today or tonight or tomorrow. I'm convinced. Um, she's just got that that you know that pyramid shape that they get. She looks super uncomfortable. The tail's right there in the center of her coils. Like she's got that look of I'm ready to go. So uh, that clutch will be here, like I said, tonight, tomorrow, at some point. I, I can't imagine she's going to go too late. Um, and then I've got an orange dream exantic that I thought so I was hoping she would go. I don't. I think she. I I ultrasounded her yesterday. Yeah, I think it was yesterday. I didn't see any follicles on her. She's a little on the young side. But she's about at that size, so I thought I'd give it a shot and see what happens. But I've, after ultrasounding, it's like you know what? I just don't think she's going to go this season. But how how often do you ultrasound your stuff? Um, so I used to do it once a month. Now I'm cutting down to about every three weeks, maybe um, two to three weeks. Is 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 I'm not at Pomona, no, I'm not. Um, but yeah, every every three weeks, I I feel like is a good is a good number. Once a month, it was. I honestly get bored and I want to it, ultrasound my stuff. So I'll go down there and I'm like, oh, I wonder if she's developing like two weeks later after ultrasounding. So I just ultrasound based on whenever I feel like it. And I'll uh -huh. ultrasound certain racks. You know, I'll do like half the collection one day and then the other half. And uh, I'm not in Pomona, no, because it is so freaking far for me to drive there. Um, next, The next show I will fly out. Uh, the main reason is we just moved in three weeks ago and I didn't want to leave. Uh, my snake room um, for a long period of time. Um, that's why I didn't schedule it. But we moved in three weeks ago, and then we had that really, really cold week. And I, was, I, I just got too nervous to leave the house. Is it now? Is your your facilities at your house then? Yes. Is it yes. like a completely separate building, or is it like down the basement or something? It's in my basement, actually. It's um, okay. we. That was the reason we bought this house specifically. Um, I was looking for somewhere where I can either build a separate building or convert a basement and just so happens this house is only about 15 minutes away from my old house and oh. it had a 5,000 square foot unfinished basement um, so, oh wow yeah it was like it was perfect yeah. I said that's a nice score dude like my snake room's down in the basement right now it's a quarter of it and planning in this season I'm going to expand it to the other quarter so I'll, it'll be half the basement will be the snake room right but uh like I'm working with the ball pythons and I'm dabbling in the carpets and the carpets take up a crap ton of room. Right. And that's the whole thing. It's like, all right, I got to expand over in that other portion a lot sooner than anticipated just because I'm starting to realize, hey, it's going to, you know, <laughs> room's going to get a little, it's going to get cramped real quick. Yeah. When, when I planned out this snake room, uh, I didn't plan for, uh, I didn't want to pack everything in. So I wanted it really open. I wanted our wash area to be wide open. I wanted the, the main room when we walk in to be open. I wanted our baby room to be open enough where I can have three carts in there and three people working at a time if we had to. Um, oh, the cool. whole room's the same thing. I wanted it wide open. I wanted 12 foot like um, wingspan if, if, if I wanted to, yeah. Ooh, yeah, that would be nice. So what, now you have it sectioned off down in your basement for like baby room and adults and stuff yeah, like so that? Yes, we have one, uh, one section of the room is just all for babies, and that room stays at 78 degrees. Uh, the main bay where we're cleaning and we're spending a lot of our time uh, is uh, 75 degrees, and then the adult room is at 78 also. Okay, all right. Dude, that's awesome, man. I hope one day I can be at that point you know i told my wife at some point because i want this to become my thing right um i'm getting kind of tired of excavating i know everybody thinks oh hey you get to be a big kid playing with giant tonka toys it gets old <laughs> right and but, everything again i i feel like because of covid a lot of people got into the mindset they're going to do this for a living um again my best advice for anybody is just kind of take it slow is i i've seen a few guys get in and they'll go from like their first clutches, they'll go to 50 clutches within a year. And it overwhelms them so fast uh, going from, okay, I've, I've only kept snakes for a few years, you know, a year or two. And then all of a sudden now you have 600 snakes because you, oh. you decide to do 50 or 100 clutches. 
and it becomes overwhelming. You start to lose time from your family because you don't know how to space out your time well. Um, so that again, for a lot of the new viewers, if you're planning on doing this, um, at any, any larger scale than, you know, 10 clutches, um, to kind of space it out so that, you know, the workload, uh, I had a buddy, he totally got burnt out of this. Thank goodness. He, he never left the industry, but, uh, I told him, I was like, you need to cut down to about 30 clutches and, and keep it manageable because he was spending weekends away from his family already. He was spending weekdays down there cleaning. You know, it was just way too much. And then all of a sudden, all of a sudden his wife's like, whoa, we're like, we're losing our marriage over snakes, you know? Snake. And um, he's losing a relationship with his, his kids because he's, you know, he, he can't make it to, you know, school events because he's at a, a show every weekend. And so that, it, that becomes a difficult thing. And I always tell people it's, it's don't try to balance it because when you're balancing things, you're like, okay, um, you know, everybody gets a piece of me that doesn't work out very well. I give, um, if you're doing snakes, a hundred percent of your, your mind needs to be in snakes. And when you're home with your family, a hundred percent of your mind needs to be with your family. Don't try yeah. to balance it. And, you know, and then you're, you're having dinner and you're, you're trying to be on morph market and, and doing all <laughs> that, that stuff. It just never works, you know? And, um, yeah, that, that's the difficulty of trying to do a, a business at home, you know, working for yourself is that. Cause at any point I could be laying in bed with my wife and then someone's like, Hey, can I get a belly picture? And I'm running down into the basement. I've gotten very good at that. If you message me after like six o'clock in the afternoon and you ask for pictures, you're getting pictures tomorrow morning. I'm not stopping what I'm yeah. doing, you know, with my family to, to go take pictures anymore. I used to do that. I was terrible at that. At midnight, you can ask for pictures. I'm running to the snake room, taking pictures for you. Cause um, I felt like <laughs> that, that customer service was so important. And now I'm thinking, look, man, if you called, you know, any business right now at six o'clock, seven o'clock, they're going to tell you to kick rocks anyways. So, yeah. um, you know, just, just yeah. handle it tomorrow. That person doesn't need that belly picture that bad, you know? And, uh, um, well, see, that's actually an interesting point. And I'm glad you made that. Cause it's something I never really thought of either, but like at some point, like you just got to kind of be like, Hey, you know, business hours are done. Like yeah. it's, it's family time and people need to respect that too. Yeah. And you, you need to train your customers, right? Uh, if you, if your customers have respect for you, um, they need to know not to call you at 11 o'clock at night, unless it's an absolute emergency. Um, my friends don't call me at 11 o'clock at night, you know, <laughs> because that's just out of pure respect, you know, don't yeah. call me at six in the morning. Uh, hell, I, I breed snakes for a, a living. Don't call me at nine in the morning. You know, I don't even get my day started until about nine o'clock. So, um, you know, it, and you'll train your customers. All my friend, all my good customers that have known me for a long time, they know I usually respond about nine in the morning and they can probably message me till about midnight, um, depending on the person. Right. If you're in, on a West Coast, usually I'm on my phone at midnight, but I'm not sending pictures. I'm not driving. I'm not walking down to my snake room and sending pictures again. Like, like all everyone's saying family times, family time. You know, yeah. even if you own your own business, I, I get it. People are like, oh, you need to make sacrifices, blah, blah, blah. I get it. But family time is family time. You know, um, you don't need to give up your family life just to appease customers that can, uh, you know, they can wait. Like I've never I've never in my life needed a picture of a second picture of a snake immediately, you know, or anything like yeah. that. It's not that important. Um, but yeah, so that that's that's my stance on that side. But um Hey, we had some important talk, topics to talk about. Let's go down that list. All right. Let's see. Uh, what were some of your first? Well, you did kind of go over that. Never mind. We got to skip that one because you kind of nailed that at the start there. Let's talk about voodoo. All right. Um, voodoo gym because I want to know more about it because that's some of the things I've heard and some of the things I've seen on your Instagram. It's got my wheels turning. <laughs> so I, um, I don't know. I, I bought the gene in for 20 bucks. So sometimes I feel bad like marketing it. Uh, cause I paid $20 for it. Uh, I bought it. How as, in the world did you find that for 20 bucks? Did somebody just think it was a normal? Uh, so, um, if you go on, um, Outback Reptiles websites, they sell African imports for $20 or they used to, okay. you can go in and pick out any normal for 20 bucks. And, um, we're, we know Ian from Outback for, uh, you've known him for a while. So they just send us random, cool looking animals, 20, 30, 50 bucks, whatever. So the animal came in for $20. It sat on the shelf for like two years. Didn't really do much with it. Cause I'm thinking it's not extreme enough to really do much. I don't want to waste all my girls breeding that, you know? 
Um, so I bred it to a, uh, I bred it to a lesser female first year and the, the animals came out pretty granity and I'm like, you know, this could be something. So I decided uh, to breed it to a uh, super Mojave. Then it came out really nice. And I was like, okay, this is a thing. We're actually going to name it. Uh, Cause at first we didn't name it. We were just do it on the shelf. It was just normal dinker. And then we bred it to a leopard clown. The leopard has such a strong interaction with it. I decided to go on with the project and bred it to DGs, clowns, and all that stuff. Um, this is our first year producing the super, which we, we showed off. We had a super voodoo. And I actually, sure uh, John, awesome. John Lehman was like, hey, how come you haven't registered voodoo? This is about three years ago. He's like, you haven't registered this morph. I'm like, I'm not going to register a morph unless I know there's a super, so that it's co-dominant. I know that it works well in clown, works well because, again, there's so many of these morphs that never make it because it doesn't work good in clown, doesn't work good in pie, doesn't work good in hypo. It, then it, the morph itself won't make it anyways. Then I had to make sure that the morph doesn't already exist. So I had to breed it to uh, genes that look like it and see, see if it produces the, the super. So I had to go. I bred it to the nanny. I bred it to a grim. I have not bred it to a pixel because I don't have a pixel. Um, but in my opinion, the, the pixel is the most similar gene to voodoo. Um, so, but again, me and Justin worked totally different project. He went and did supers and red stripes. I went and did DGs and I did the Lucy complex. So we don't have a lot of animals to compare to each other, but next year we will. Um, and for a lot of newer people, I, I'm going to give you this advice, especially in, uh, in any type of gene that you are uh, working on for yourself. Like, let's say you found an animal, you found it's cool. It, it doesn't matter. It can come from PetSmart. It can come from um, import bag. It can come from any your personal collection. Uh, because these mutations just pop up randomly, right? If it, if it can pop up in Africa, it can also pop up here. Um, there's true. absolutely there's absolutely no reason why a new gene can't pop up in a captive collection when they're popping up in Africa, right? So if a, a new gene pops out and, and you have the gene, uh, the be my best advice to you is do not sell it. Um, I spent the first three years not selling voodoo's to anybody. Um, you the last thing you need to do is you have a cool new gene. Let's you, let's say you call it um, what the mask or whatever. I, I said the mask because I have my favorite. I want to tell you my favorite movie on here. I say the mask. I don't know if I keep mentioning this, but um, <laughs> I have a sign Jim Carrey uh, poster here. But um, but let's say you have this new gene. The last thing you want to do is if you see a lot of potential, and then you're like, well, I kind of need the money, or I want the money. You sell that snake to me for a thousand bucks. I have a much larger collection than you, and then I'm going to breed it to a DG clown or a clown pied, and all of a sudden you're five steps behind me. Yeah. Um, you know, and then you find out that gene's worth ten thousand dollars because it's like amazing. You know, and this has happened to quite a few people uh, by selling out a collection, a, a gene way too early. The best person who's ever managed, in my opinion, ever managed a new mutation is Ozzy with Orange Dream. He he had so many super Orange Dream combos by the time he released Orange Dreams that you couldn't catch him in it. Um, again, you know, and I've seen guys fumble it. They have a new gene. They sell it off to a new breeder. I mean, a bigger breeder. And that big breeder is like 10 steps ahead of them now, you know? So again, just a little piece of advice when you're working a, a new mutation. Now with that, like that would even come down to like, if, say you produce some, uh, triple recessive visual that no one's ever produced yet. Right. And someone would say you came along and offered me 20 grand or whatever, you know, if I sell it, like you just said, you're light years ahead of me then all of a sudden, just because right. you can run into so much more stuff. Right. So like um, like when Justin produced the Azanthic DG Clown, um, me and JP went to his house. I offered him $100,000 for it, and he turned it down. Holy shit. <laughs> yeah. Justin, again, Justin is uh, probably one of the smartest guys I've met, you know, that does this. Um extremely intelligent uh he knows what that animal is worth i can literally breed that to a single gene a xanthic and make twenty thousand dollar clutches you know yeah. i can breed it and if i had the right animals let's say let's say i had a bunch of dg clowns i now making a bunch of dg clown head of xanthics that's 20 grand a piece so he he knows how much that and that type of animal is worth if you produce let's say you produce that type of animal and i offered you 50 grand 100 grand for it and you sell it, you just missed out on five, 
five clutches later, that's five hundred thousand dollars you just missed out on. So yeah. a lot of times, um, though, that gets tricky because I've had, I've been very lucky. I've talked a lot of breeders into selling me some really good stuff, and um, again, I, 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 it's hard to blame me, right? Because you have you have produced an awesome animal. I'm gonna make you a really nice offer because I know what I can do with that animal. I know I have the females for it. And I almost feel bad sometimes because I had a very good friend produce a very nice animal. And I offered him a price that's hard to refuse. And after I got the animal, I felt bad buying it because this animal, uh, I probably made 10 times my money was worth on that animal the first year he bred. And oh, again, wow. Depending on your collection, though, you know, like if you have the right amount of females, it's worth more money to you. He didn't have that many females for it. It wasn't worth as much to him. You know, uh, did you breed voodoo to an acid or confusion? I actually am. Uh, I have that pairing going right now. Uh, the problem for that pairing for me last year was a lot of my confusion females were way too small to breed. Uh, finally, I have a lot of uh, confusion females up to size. So finally, I, I, do, I will have that coming. See, now with what you're saying about buying that snake off your friend, that comes down to a point where, you know, friend Bob is different than business Bob. Like you were making a pure business decision on that right. one. Right. So we are friends. We are friends. But in my head, I'm thinking now, right? Okay. On, from a business perspective, I give you $10,000 for the snake. I have eight or 10 females lined up for this animal. And I know each clutch will make me. Ten to fifteen thousand dollars, or whatever the number is, right? I'm using ten again, uh, guys. It's not ten. I, I'm I'm using ten thousand because it's an easy number. Um, it, from a bit, you have to make right business decisions a lot of times because you can't just go on emotions, right? A lot of times when when we're new, we go on a lot of emotions, and we're like, oh, I like this snake because it's pretty. Well, who cares that no one likes spider? I like spider. Just because you like spider doesn't mean you're going to make a ton of money off spiders because the general yeah. public will buy it, right? So you have to make that type of business decision. Like when we made the decision to cut out 90% of our spiders as breeders, it sucks because I actually like spiders. It was one of my first mutations, but it was a bad business decision to breed a lot of spiders because when you go to shows and you have a bunch of spiders on the table, they're not going to move and you have to cut prices. Um, so that type of, that's more business than the emotional side of the industry. Matt here says, so the voodoo and paired with Grim or Nanny didn't make a super. That's right. uh, I did not. I bred the voodoo to a nanny. I did not make a super. I made a very uh, granite type animal. And it, I'll be honest, it wasn't that pretty. Um, it wasn't that cool. And then uh, the genes I would not recommend to use with voodoo. Uh, it's Enchi. I was very surprised the Enchi voodoo sucked. Uh, it just looked no, like a really? really dark. It just was a really dark Enchi. Um, <laughs> I think the, the gene itself needs to be with more extreme um pattern influence not pattern like like black pastel mojave it worked great in leopard um but and i, I made ultra male hats so i'm going to work for ultra male hats uh i'm breeding my sunset uh combo male uh the sunset yellow belly male to a, a leopard um voodoo now so i want to make hats for those uh and stuff like that um, I'm if you don't mind, I'm just gonna start answering questions. I feel like a yeah, lot no, of times these become no, really you're, we're, we're good, dude. We can just roll with the punches because everybody, you know, I want to give what the audience wants, right? Like it becomes like an interactive thing, and a lot of times when people ask questions, other people are thinking it too, you know. Um, yeah. so I actually because mainly because I like this question, uh, how do I feel about monsoons? So the thing about it is a lot of times I personally will avoid genes that I don't personally, um, again, this is from a very emotional side of the, the investment is that I don't see enough potential for me to invest. I don't own a monsoon. I'll, I'll be honest. I don't own a monsoon because the few monsoons I've seen on market, again, I, I love Dave Green. I love um, uh, Brock Wagner and all those guys and what they're doing with it, but I don't see monsoon changing enough um, as a gene. Right. I, I, we've seen the few monsoon combos out pastel, banana, all those. They all look the same to me. It, they, personally. That was, that's the only that, I don't mean to interrupt. That is the one thing that I, I like. I love the look of it, but you're right. It doesn't change. Every combo right. I've seen, it looks the same. Right. The monsoon is a beautiful mutation by itself. And then you add the other genes. It still looks like a monsoon. And yeah. it's not like clown where, OK, the single gene clown, nice snake, good base. Then you can add all these things, and then now you have 
20 different clowns you can put on a table and they all look different. Whereas monsoons, if you put 20 different monsoons, is the tint is a little bit different. But again, this has happened to a lot of genes uh, where someone just needs to make the exact right combo to just really kill it, right? Uh, yeah. I say this, and then I am fairly heavily invested in Sunset, which, in my opinion, a lot of people's opinion is that Sunsets are ugly. Uh, sunset aged horribly. I And I own 50, nah, I don't want to say 50 Sunsets. I probably own 50, yeah, actually 50 Sunset animals, hats and visuals. Wow. And they are not good-looking adults. Um, my adult Sunset females, I, I have fire yellow bellies that look better than them. There will, however, be combos of sunsets that come out amazing. I think the Desert Ghost is going to fix all of Sunset's problems. Just like I feel like Desert Ghost saved uh, Xanthix, in my opinion. Yeah. Um, uh, Mahogany Voodoo. That's, actually, I actually haven't done that one. I, I need to do that one. I did. Um, I didn't do Mahogany Voodoo's, but I did a uh, Bongo Voodoo's, and those are nice, by the way. <clears throat> but yeah, Sunset is is so strong, also. But it does give a great base because the Sunset Clown's amazing. Sunset Pied's amazing. Um, I We haven't seen the Monsoon Clown or Monsoon Pied. I, I think we've seen Monsoon Clown, I want to say. But the Monsoon Pied, okay, we're waiting on that, I believe, too. Uh, and neither one of those have been played. I think we're going to hit that possibly this year, if I remember Alston saying. Yeah, and the, D D the DG Monsoon's probably going to be amazing. I'll be honest. DG Monsoon's going to be freaking amazing. Um, but the thing is... Do you think DG will change that pattern at all? No, yeah. DG is not a pattern changer. You know, um, DG is a is a pure. Uh, I want to say like um, it just retains that. So Monsoon's actually not an ugly adult. It just it just brightens it. Like I, if I put a DG clown next to a regular clown, you're like, oh my god, that fixed that whole uh, as adult. Yeah. Fix it. So I don't know if it will fix the gene or, or whatever we're, we're calling it, but I think it will definitely enhance it. Um, okay. So I think Monsoon has a lot of way to go. I mean, look, the, the problem for me right now is obviously price point. Um, and once the price drops some, I'll probably grab one or two just in case to work into a project. But um, at that price point right now, I'm not investing. Um, however, the gene itself is amazing. Um, and I can see where a few of these guys' minds are going with it. Um, I'm, I'm watching some of the heads that they're making. Um Brock's making a lot of pied heads. I think he's. I think he sees a lot of potential in monsoon pied, and I can agree with it. Uh, it's a long term project, and a lot of a lot of great projects are long term project, and people got to think you know three five years ahead. And it's going to be great. Now, with what with uh, the sunset topic, brighter jeans or darker jeans? What works best with the sunset? Um, so I think everything comes in waves, uh, like, especially like, like I'm, I always use clowns like, as example, because that's been how the market is going based on clowns. Um, at first, everyone wanted really bright clowns, super pastel clown, pastel and yellow belly clowns, all this stuff. And then later on, people realize how much more granite -y patterns we can get in darker clowns, black pastel spot nose clowns, red stripe clowns. Those are the darker clowns. Uh, in Sunset, we I think we've done a lot of light jeans. I've made Banana Sunset, Super Banana Sunset, Lesser Sunsets. I made those, um, and they're okay. I'll be honest with you. Even as adults, like a bright banana to start with, aren't amazing adults. Um, I Redwood, uh, you know Redwood Reptiles. Yeah, he made a Leopard Spot Nose Sunset, and that thing's amazing. Um, I think even as an adult, that thing will be amazing um and you know the leopard sunset combos have been amazing the yellow belly sunset combos i think um i want to say brad boa made a spot nose yellow belly sunset it was very uh -huh. nice a lavender albino sunset wow yes that's what i was gonna say i was gonna say lavender albino reminds me of the sun dragon yeah i mean it's a beautiful animal yeah. that, that thing glows when i he, saw he it I... Even soon oh man this guy is that we you now we're really thinking Ooh, yes. There was another question. Uh, Ashley here from Pip Stalker said, wants to know about blackhead voodoo. Uh, blackhead voodoo I haven't done mainly. Uh, so I don't know if you've noticed, but blackheads in the super form gets a little bit problematic sometimes. Um, so I, I was trying to avoid doing blackheads, spot nose, and, and more problematic genes. I went with the spot nose anyways because I had a cinnamon Batman female that was ready to breed. So I went with that, but I didn't go with blackheads. And I didn't go with champagnes. I didn't go with Hinjin Woma. I kind of just avoided that kind of 
um, that allele altogether. Um, I, there's probably people who bought uh, voodoo's for me that will do that pairing, but I personally avoided uh, all of the wobble jeans to start with. Yeah, not a bad move, I guess. I mean, spot knows that spot knows goes good with so much stuff, though. I that's a that'd be a hard one to stay out of. Right, right. Nicholas wants to know if you're going to be at any expos in Nashville. Nashville, I will be there. I believe in April for the Nashville Pet Expo. It's really weird for me to do that expo because we're trying to drop all of our smaller shows and do the you know NARBCs and stuff. But that show is so much fun. It's hard for me to skip it. Um, they charge two dollar admission, so you have oh, like wow. twelve thousand people through the door that have no idea about snakes. And I actually love that uh, that type of environment. Um, I enjoy the NARBC where I just talk about mutations and talk about breeding the whole time. But I also like to educate people, you know, just with hey, this is a ball python, and this is what we can do with it. Um, and also, they sell monkeys there, so that's a lot of fun. Uh, one year, someone offered me a kangaroo in trade for a, <laughs> it. was like um, I had a hypo pie female. This was years ago. I had a hypo pie female on the table, and a guy offered me a kangaroo for it. That's so, all. I always like to go to these shows. It's, it's, it's fun. So I'll be in Nashville at the Nashville Pet Expo. <laughs> all right. Now, if someone were to offer you a monkey for a snake, would you take it? No, no. I, I, no. I think monkeys are the worst, absolutely worst pets because that animal is too intelligent to belong in a cage. Um, sometimes I look at an animal. Again, I worked at a, I worked with an animal sanctuary for a long time, and you're looking at these animals, and you're looking into their eyes, and a monkey is looking at you, and and you know the wheels are turning in there, you know. They're such intelligent animals, and they can be such assholes. They throw poop at you. They're just planning <laughs> your death. You know, it's just like it's too smart of an animal to sit in a cage. Um, kangaroo is just another. It's just another beast, man. I, I, I actually wanted the kangaroo so bad. My wife would have kicked my butt bringing home a kangaroo, but um, <laughs> not a monkey. Anything but a mon I would. I mean, I love. I actually love monkeys. But they are way too intelligent for people to keep as pets. 99% of the population to keep as a pet. Because um, the animal sanctuary near me, it's about 15 minutes from my house. Uh, the amount of surrendered monkeys, because people buy them as pets, and then they come home and terrorize their house, and then they <laughs> surrender them. And we get them, oh, in stuff bad, we get them in bad shape, man. We have uh, one monkey out there, uh, Gabe. Uh, he has no teeth because someone bought him as a pet. He bit him, and they yanked out all his teeth. What? And you're like, you did realize you bought a monkey. Like even children bite, kids yeah, bite, everything you know, bites, <laughs> anything bites. And they bought a monkey, it bit him, they yanked out all his teeth, and we ended up with him as a, a rescue. Sweetest animal you can find, but any animal can t can throw an, a tan um, a tantrum and bite you, you know. And it just happens, you know. And it's it's terrible to see. I hate seeing monkeys in the pet trade. I'll be honest. There's certain animals I would. If you allowed me to, I would ban them from the pet trade. I hate to say it like that. I hate big government, but these animals get neglected and abused uh, over time because they live a long time and people just can't handle it. 99% of the population can't handle it. Hell, Sokatas. Have you seen some of the conditions some of these Sokatas live in? Uh, yeah. People buy these beautiful, uh, cute little tortoise for like 50 bucks at Repticon. And then they get 100 pounds and they just throw them away because so you can basically get you end up with some of your where you can almost ride it around the house. Yeah, they, you bought they a tank. Realize. What you did is you bought a tank, you bought a destructive animal. I mean, and the worst part for a Sokata is they live forever, so they just lived abused life forever. So, yes, if I can get rid of some animals from the pet trade, I, I, I honestly would. Beast here wants to know, uh, he says he's loving zebra, but he needs to see a little bit more from it. What's your thought on zebra? That's uh, one that, my, that has caught my eye. So I forget, what was it? Was it a super pastel zebra? I saw something mixed with zebra, and it looked phenomenal, and my brain automatically kicked it into Exantic. Right. And it the wheels were turning very, very good on that one. Um, so zebra, I think the one that caught my eye the most was the pastel Enchi hypo zebra. Um, this was a project I offered on to get in on about three years ago, I, but I, I was very stubborn and big headed. And I told Adam, I want the whole project or none of it. Like literally I made an offer and I said, I want every zebra animal you own. 
Um, I was big headed. I was air, trying to be arrogant with it. And uh, of course, luckily he said no and he kept the project and did amazing with it. Um, and then right now I, I, at the price point that it's at and, and all that, I am going to not get in it yet. Uh, I need to see a little bit more out of it. I need to, I need to be a hundred percent sure that it's again, at, at any point of a new project, I need to be a hundred percent sure. First of all, it's not a Lelic with anything else. Um, not the same mutation as anything else and that it works good in clowns and pies. That is going to be the longevity of any project. Is it a Lelic with something? Is it the same as something? And is it good in clowns and pies? Um, look at the, um, uh, the cryptic project being a Lelic with clown. Some say it's yeah. good, but in my opinion, it's not because then, you know, being a Lelic with clown, it, 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 it just, hinders the project in my opinion but then it looked great in some combos and it now but now you can't make a cryptic clown so that kind of hurt the project you know so that's true i didn't think about it. but yeah i mean kryptons are nice but like you said i mean you don't end up with that double visual then right right beats said that they made a voodoo champagne brought lots of darkness and pattern back into it nice i think that's voodoo one thing champagne. with champagne the only reason I didn't do it, in my in my opinion, the only reason I didn't do it is, first of all, I don't have a lot of champagnes in my collection. But uh, champagne is, was so overpowering, I was actually scared to make the to to do it and then not see it. Was my was my yeah. uh, my my hesitance. Yeah. I good topic, Matt. Good topic, Matt. Let's talk about some of your charities. <laughs> um. So I I, I feel like. Uh, well, the, the last charity uh, drive we did was the um, Toys for Tots uh, events. Um, the local church here reached out to me last year about raising money for children in the area. Um, and we raised $7,500 last year. This, this year we raised $12,500. Um, the community has been more than amazing in that sense. Every time I've done a charity event, the, the overwhelming amount of support has been amazing. We did a charity uh, for Australia in 2020 when it was burning down. Uh, we raised $10,000 that we were able to send to the Australia Zoo. Um, I was I did a lot of research before I, I decided where to send the money. Um, they Their money actually goes to rescuing animals that are losing you know the, their homes at the time. And then um, now we're going to be focusing pretty much an annual um, Toys for Tots drive every year. I'm going to start at the beginning of December. We try to raise $10,000 for, for kids. Uh, we ended up with 1,100 uh, presents bought um, for these kids. So you, you imagine how many of these kids, uh, you know, Christmas might have been, you know, even just a little bit better. You know, uh, when I was growing up, um, Toys for Tots donated to us. Uh, when we were living in government housing, you know, and again, I would never in a thousand years blame my parents uh, because we came to America in 93. Uh, my parents didn't speak English and just uh, got the, any job they, they had, you know, so uh, toys and, and, and Christmas presents is like on the bottom of the list, you know, that top yeah. of the list, obviously food and shelter. Um, so I would never blame my parents for any of it. But the fact that my dad swallowed his pride, went out to Toys for Tots, they helped make our Christmas when we were younger. Um, so that's always stuck with me. And um, and we're just lucky that the community has helped me to help these children um, just have a better Christmas. Awesome, dude. Awesome. Uh, before we move on, I want to take a minute because we are at like almost 60 people. I want to take a minute here to thank uh, Chris from BNS for sponsoring this week's episode as well. Oh, hold on here. Wait, wrong clicky. All this new stuff. Here we go. Here's the right one. And this episode is sponsored by BNS Reptilia. BNS Reptilia, folks, let me tell you, is a one stop shop for basically whatever you may need. If you're looking for ball pythons, Chris has it. He's working in so many different projects and he's got amazing quality animals. He's also got blood pythons, gorgeous, gorgeous blood pythons. He's also working with different types of colubers like Mexican black king snakes, bull snakes, pine snakes, even. He's working a couple different boa projects, Australian species even, like Woma pythons and scrub pythons. He's got it all, folks. BNS Reptilia is one place you want to go to if you need a snake. And on top of it, he also supplies Eastern PA with different types of rodents like rats, ASFs. He's got it all. If you need cocoa, he is the Pennsylvania's distributor of cocoa to go and the chipper. 
So definitely do not miss out on what I consider by far the best cocoa substrate on the market. Chris sells it. Go to him. He is our distributor. And make sure you tell him Jeremy sent you from Warfels Morphs because you might just get a little bit of a surprise if you tell him that. Thank you, Chris, for sponsoring this episode. I greatly appreciate it, brother. All right. Thank you, Chris. Uh, we had another question here. Uh, Balls Deep wants to know, what else do you keep? Uh, mostly ball pythons. That room down there is mostly ball pythons. I have a, um, a separate room uh, blocked off down there that runs a different temperature where I keep my dart frogs, crested geckos, uh, knobtail geckos, um, some turtles. I just keep a bunch of random like pet stuff in that other room. Um, but I don't really breed anything else, just, just ball pythons. Awesome. What well, is there one species you would love? Like, if you had the room, what's one species you would add into the collection to work with? Oh, my goodness. So, when we were planning the snake room, original, my idea originally was a 10,000 square foot building, um, oh, wow. and like a standalone building. And then I realized I never want that large of a collection. But the reason for the 10,000 square foot building was I was going to get a pair of Komodo dragons. Um, oh, wow. Uh, yeah, I, I honestly, I, I sourced it. I, I was gonna, trying to find, you know, a way to get a pair of promoted dragons. And then I realized, again, like I said earlier, how irresponsible it would be for me to own a pair <laughs> of muted dragons. Um, I would love a uh, a pair or trio of earless monitors. Um, Florida oh, USARC okay. was giving away the trio in the raffle, and that would be an, like amazing, amazing species. So Awesome. See, all right. I didn't, I wasn't sure what you were going to throw there. The Komodo dragon, I didn't see coming, but they would be neat. <laughs> I wanted uh, a pair so bad. <laughs> <laughs> as far as monitors and stuff like that, or Komodos and all that stuff, I would love to have, uh, what are they? Um, the green tree monitors. Oh, I yeah. think that they're just so, like, so beautiful. That bright lime green, just man those things are awesome but i do have uh, like i have things. a random space in my basement that was going to turn into an enclosure and i that i think that would might be next on my list is what i would like as a pet would be a blue tree monitor um Ooh. but it's like i i've had tegus before i've had um i have had a few, few uh, lizard species i've bred beer dragons you know i kept a few of those it's just like the the tree monitors are small enough where they are still um you can still treat them well in a small enclosure the in in the monitor world i feel like i almost feel bad for a lot of those animals too the sulfur uh the, the water monitors and and these these larger monitor species i'm watching a lot of new people buy them because they're cool yep. you're watching a guy handle you know a rhino uh rhino iguana or whatever and they're, they're super intelligent and they, the guys that are videoing this stuff only shows you the best of the best, right? The most tame uh, water monitor or black dragon. And 90% of the animals that people actually buy are like batshit crazy. Um, and, you know, it's going to tear their arm up. Um, uh, croc monitors, I almost like those are tough too. But I think tree uh, tree monitors, green tree monitors or blue trees are are actually gonna would make way better pets they're intelligent and they're they fairly small in comparison to the yeah. other monitors and um you know caging wise i believe if you put like an eight foot wide you know you want a tall click cage so maybe like a a five or six footer um you know and then that's that's good enough but i almost feel like most people can't handle uh, uh housing a large tegu or water monitor you know that's it's tough they require a lot of space and a lot of a uh, lot of maintenance that's one like when I see them at sh like the Nile monitors and stuff like that. It's just like man, it's like you know some of the people that are buying them say I I always think about say I hope you did your research because that thing's cute right now and it looks nice. It's gonna grow freaking quick and you're gonna be right. left with this small dragon. I'm, I'm glad you mentioned Nile monitors because really honestly that was the worst one because uh, a croc monitor is expensive, right? It's Three thousand dollars. Most or black dragons are like three, four thousand dollars. So most people who buy those will do a lot of research before you, you invest in that. But God, man, now monitors are like 60 bucks at a Repticon. Yeah. Anybody can buy a, a now monitor or, or one of those. And they they live horrible lives because every 
I've seen so many vendors will sell you a now monitor and tell you to put it in a 20 gallon and it's <laughs> they'll outgrow them in a, in a month. You know, it's like buying a retick. Yeah. It's like buying a retick and putting it in a, in a tub, you know, it just doesn't yeah. work. See that I would love to have, that's another thing. I held my first retick in uh, last year. I loved experiencing it because it was like a mix between a ball python and a carpet you had the slow moving gentle side of the ball python with the activity level of a carpet right. and it's like because i always think carpets always seem like they're always thinking like you look at them they're thinking something through right. um and it's the same thing with the retic like that's that's a snake that's thinking as opposed to a ball python just kind of sits there and doesn't really care much about what's ball going pythons on. like when you look at a ball python you're like what is actually even going on up there like, there's absolutely <laughs> yes. no brain activity you know it only lights up when you throw a rat in and even when you throw a rat in the ball python's either thinking oh that doesn't smell right i'm not eating it you know or <laughs> it's not like a retic you can yep. tell a re the retic is, is such an intelligent large snake and uh it it, it it demands respect and i feel like a lot of buyers now are getting into it because they're watching way too many Jay Brewer videos. Um, and they think retics is like the coolest thing to own a 20 foot retic. And I've handled a lot of retics. I don't own any retics, um, mainly because they are more than I can handle personally. I'll, I'll be honest with that. It's, it's more, it's too much animal for me to handle. And I, I, I know some of the best retic breeders, um, that are very responsible. And then I'm watching some retic breeders sell baby retics to 10 year olds at shows, you know, so and that's that's a tough one to a pill to swallow for the industry overall It's watching someone sell an animal that they shouldn't be selling, you know, um, and what am I going to do go over there and piss on this pot, you know, I can't be like, hey, you shouldn't be doing that. Again, that guy has a family to support too. however, selling a retic to a 10 year old is is not ethical. No, but then that also falls down onto the parents though too for not doing the research on top of it as well. Yeah, we can and say that. We can say that, man. I'll be honest with you. When I was um, when I was fourteen, I told my dad I wanted a snake, and he says, "As long as you pay for it, it's your snake." He didn't care what species of snake I was mine. He didn't know he wasn't going to go Google that himself. Um, and then again, ninety nine percent of parents now don't even care what their kids watch on YouTube. You know, I'm watching, you know, so yes, we can blame the parents, but we also have to police our own industry and hold these breeders accountable. Don't sell snakes to children uh, and, until you explain to the parents, hey, this snake will get eight feet in a year, 12 that, foot. In that two is years. a very good point. Yeah. You know, can you guys handle that? Can you house that? Can you feed that? You know, like I get it. We can we can blame the parents, but then, you know, we know better as as an industry. We should know better. Good question, Eric. Yeah. Eric wants to know if you breed your own rodents. Um, I do breed some. Uh, I don't personally. I have a you know a guy for it, but we do breed some of our own rodents, uh, and we feed everything live. Tomorrow is actually my feeding day, so one of my guys will bring over a thousand rodents, and we'll be done by the end of the day. And um, it's a long day. <laughs> how many snakes? Do you, like how many snakes do you have in your collection, Bob? I mean, I know um, you got a lot, but. Right now is over a thousand um, because we have a lot of babies. Uh, okay. We still have a lot of leftover babies from 2022. Um, the the hatching room is about 500 animals. Uh, that that's okay. that's the bulk of it. Yeah, but um, we go through about 500 mice and 500 rats a week. Okay, all right. I guess I didn't. When you said a thousand, I'm there thinking like just adults. I was thinking, yeah. I was like, holy crap! I will never. <laughs> like, I knew you had I will a lot. Never, I will probably never do that light type of quantity. I'm watching. I've I've met people who do, do a thousand clutches. I've met people who do 500 clutches. I don't want anything to do with that, dude. <laughs> Not at all. What are some of your most anticipated pairings for this season? Um, without giving too much away on what we're trying to hatch, uh, I think Strangers is going to be my first year hatching Strangers and Stranger Clowns, Stranger DGs, um, Azanthic DGs, obviously are. Uh, and combos would be um, my most anticipated because I actually love the project. I actually hatched my first ones last year. Um, DG clowns, 
always always a popular choice however i feel like dg clowns i've made a lot of combos i probably i think let me see i've made 15 combos already um now it's time to expand that project add it into hypo add it into exantic add it into pides add it into tri stripe um stuff like that so that's where we're going to try to expand out i don't want to just sit here and spam dg clowns for days because i could you know i can just breed all my dg clown males all my dg clown females but that doesn't move us forward any um so even with lower odds and even with out making as much money by producing the hats uh we're going to try to move it forward and add the new genes into it um for xanthic um i, I use a vpi xanthic line um all of our that was, was going to be my next question i was going to ask you i thought you were vpi but i wasn't yeah. sure and honestly when you're choosing your xanthic line um for who if you don't have any xanthics right now if you're choosing your xanthic line it's just whatever you like there's no wrong answers no right answer i made a pure business decision when we chose the Z line of a xanthic we, we chose the most popular one and the reason we chose the most popular one instead of going with well i want to work this line because no one else is I just went with the most popular one because I wanted to sell my babies. It's easier to sell popular hats and visuals when other people already work the project. You know? So that was just a business decision. I say I'm working with TSK, but right. yeah, man, Again, like I love John Dig. John Dig has done more for Xanthix than I, I've seen anyone else do for a mutation. You know, so he's got killer stuff. I enjoy. I had him on last year. I really enjoyed that live. That was an awesome right. live. With that. John's a great guy, even even though he works along the wrong Xanthic. He's a he's a great guy. <laughs> <laughs> that that just reminds me of a conversation I had in my group chat with a whole bunch of my buddies. We were talking about uh, Xanthics, and somebody said something about. I forget how it was, but I told them, yeah, that's you just like brown snakes, and that's why you like VPI or something. Oh, like yeah. That. yeah, we, we bring that up too. It's okay. Cool. The VPI guys bring that up too. <laughs> um, Joel here wants to know your opinion on the ball python market right now, which is one of the topics anyway. So let's just jump into that. All right, the market right now is soft, guys. I'll, I'll have to be honest with you. Um, I actually had one of my best sales week two weeks ago. Uh, Christmas week was my one of my best sales week. Uh, we sold, oh God, it, more than thirty animals online uh, on oh, off nice. morph market, uh, off morph market on Christmas week. Um, it, it was uh, I don't know what the the I honestly can't tell you what the reason was. But I had a lot of inquiries and we just sold a ton of animals. Um, the market is is good. It's just soft. When I say soft, I mean uh, if some if you have a snake posted for fifteen hundred dollars, if you're going to offer me thirteen fifty. I'm probably going to take it. The reason for that is you have to understand that there's probably when I price my animals, I'm going to price it across the board kind of in line with everybody else. So I have to understand if I'm posting something that's not super unique, like if I'm posting, let's say a Batman, there's probably 40 Batmans on Morph Market, all at the exact same price. Um, that customer just wants a deal. That customer wants to know that they won that deal. They got a deal out of it. So if they're going to offer me slightly less, uh, probably take the deal. But if it's a very unique animal that no one else has posted and I'm the one creating the pricing, um, I'm going to be a little bit uh, bullish on it. I'm going to I'm probably going to be uh, pretty, pretty firm. But again, there's a there's a lot of inventory right now. This happens every year and everyone thinks the sky is falling. This happens every single year uh, around Christmas time because everyone hatched their snakes between September and November. And then all yep. of a sudden there's a ton of inventory in December and January by may by april may june the tax season comes nobody has inventory i uh, march is our best sales month uh, uh everyone knows of uh, march and april are the best sales months because people got tax money and we do tin lee and we do the, the other shows and we just crush it um so sometimes i'll just sit on inventory and wait till february march april and, and i don't do any shows in january because i know the market is soft in january so come March, I'm going to just crush it, and, and, uh, you know, when, when the market gets better. So don't be so in, in a rush because you're, you're scared of what people online are saying or or whatever and wholesale all your stuff off. I'll sit on my inventory and people are like, oh, don't we have to feed that stuff? I'm like, yes, I do, but I'm not going to wholesale it off or I can just wait until March and April when people get their tax money and make 30, 40 percent more money that way. Um, yeah. so the market is soft, but one thing, what, one thing that's in your advantage when the market is like that is you get to keep, um, more animals back. Your holdbacks become cheaper. Um, in 2020, I couldn't even hold back animals. 
I was only holding back like a handful of animals because people were offering me way over perceived retail, what I thought was retail. People were offering me crazy money in 2020, 2021 because of COVID. And so I didn't hold back a lot. This year, I'm going to get to hold back a bunch of animals or more animals than I usually would because the price is lower. And if I feel like that price is so cheap, I might as well keep it for myself. So I just keep them. Um, so you're getting your holdbacks cheaper. Um, if you wait for the right timing, you're going to be able to make money. Um, don't panic. I see a lot of people panicking. Um, in my Patreon, we always talk about it. We always discuss the market. Um, and I, I try to keep everyone level-headed. And a lot of my Patreon members are making a lot more money than they would have if they were just going to wholesale it out. So. See, that's what, like, with that, like, everybody, a lot of people have been saying basically the sky is falling. And I've, like, I've had... Grant, I only had three clutches this year. Last year, I had four completely sold out. This year, I had three, but I held back a lot less. And I sold basically everything I produced. I still have three babies left in the rack from last season. But it's like, you know, I don't really think the market's that bad. I think it's very good. You just got to have what people want, and you've got to find that right person that wants to spend the money. I think people are perceiving this market as being bad because the last two years were so good. Um, you have people have to understand that before COVID, this is exactly what the market was like in 2018, 2019. Everyone was sitting on inventory in December uh, because that's what the market was like. COVID caused more people to come into the industry. More people had money in their pockets because uh, of COVID money. We call it COVID, uh, all those COVID sales. And I, I made all these memes about those $1,400 deals. I was crushing $1,400 sales. But now it's slowed down, right? Those These people got to go back to work. Less people are people getting into the industry. It's slowed down some. Now we're getting back into our 2018 and 19 market. This is not, the sky isn't falling. It just leveled out. Um, yeah. People were like, oh my God, the Desert Ghost prices dropped back down to, I, I, got, I got flamed the other day when I posted a Desert Ghost female for 600 bucks. And I was like, do people not remember in 2019 they were selling for four hundred dollars and <laughs> I, I was like and now that's leveled out i was like it's good money still but uh people just have to kind of get their minds wrapped around how the market is changing and adapt and then there will be an influx again once certain guys panic and sell out there'll be an influx and then we're going to go back up and i'm just going to wait for that day and i'm I did this in 2019. I got lucky. I was sat on a bunch of inventory, COVID hits, and then I sold out in a week. You know, so it just happens like that. Uh, and uh, right now, someone mentioned, you know, Creative uh, Genetics mentioned yep. 48,000 snakes on uh, on Morph Market. It's 8,000 more than last year. This time last year, I was probably shipping out 20 boxes a week. Uh, oh, again, wow. COVID, the 2000, 2021, 2022, early 2022, we were slinging snakes like it's nobody's business. These wholesalers were probably shipping out hundreds of animals a week. And uh, it's just a difference. And right now, the market slowed down some. 8,000 more than last year. Again, this is the highest time of the year you're going to see snakes. Uh, people are hatching heavily the last three months. No one really hatches many ball pythons in January, February, and March. No one really has eggs. You know, So yeah. just wait, and it'll, it'll, it'll steady out. Um, don't panic. When do you start seeing the majority of your clutches starting to drop? Is it like kind of that uh, March on type of deal? Or when does your season normally kick off? Um, last year, a lot of it was between June and August, September. This year, okay. we're going to have probably our earliest year ever. Uh, I don't know. I think a lot of it has to do with the weather change. We had a cold snap early. Um, yeah. I have about 60 females right now that are developing heavily. And um, we'll probably be almost a third of the way through by March, which is very, okay. very early for us. We usually get our most of our eggs in the summer. Okay. All right. Awesome. Uh, let's see here. I lost. Um, what are some of the underutilized morphs out there that you think that people aren't really using that they should? So that's a difficult part because it used to be easy to answer that easier to answer that when there was like, I don't know, a hundred ball python breeders. Now there's, I don't know, 5,000 ball python breeders. There's no, I feel like there's no underutilized morphs anymore. 
because there's every morph, there's a hundred guys working it, 200 guys working it. But in my opinion, I, I feel like people need to focus more on a, a certain project. Like if you're going to work on a certain project, don't just tell me, Hey, I'm going to work DGs. I'm like, look, there's, if you're just going to say DG, I'm going to ask you, you're going to do DG pies, clown, hypos, tri-stripe, albinos, you know, there's, there's a million different options to do it, but you're going to say, Hey, I want to create the darkest contrast animal I possibly can. I want to work this specific project, DG, tri-stripe. No, this is that project, right? It's going to take you yeah. five, eight years. You're going to have to shelf away and hold back probably 25 animals. Um, that is a project. Saying I want to work DGs is not a project. I say I want to work DG Azantic and add spot nose into it. That's a project. And you can breed, breed your Azantic spot nose to a DG and blah blah blah. You know when uh, so sometimes I have to sit down with with people. You know a, a lot of our our newer breeders that you know or, or whatever, and I kind of have to break it down for them on what route they want to go. You know, don't be too broad. The problem with being too broad, especially in this industry, is that there's I don't know two thousand mutations out there. And you're going to want to collect one of each and it, it just doesn't work. You know, like when, when all these members mm -hmm. ask right now, Hey, do you have monsoon? Do you have this? Remember um, we're all limited in space. We're limited in money. We're limited in rodents. Um, so pick the genes you like. It's okay to not have certain genes. doesn't mean you don't like it. I like monsoons. I just don't own them. You know, yeah. it's okay to not have certain projects because you're limited in space. You can't have everything or you shouldn't have everything. Because if you did, it will be like balancing. You, you'll you neglect certain projects because you have one of each each mutation. It just doesn't work out great. No, that makes perfect sense. Um, what are, what's a morph or two that you think people need to look out for in the future? That you think maybe it's not on the radar right now, but you think there's potential for it to blow up? Um, so someone asked earlier, what mutation am I adding to my personal collection this coming year? Um, I recently acquired a Hydra animal. Um, I know this is not a very well-known project, but uh, I saw the Hydra clown being produced this past year, so I ended up picking up a Hydra. Um, me and Josh went 50-50 on that project. That's a Hydra clown. I forgot which one. A Black Pastel Lesser Hydra clown. Um, so I'm, I'm liking that project. I think people should definitely, definitely, if you do not have chocolate in your collection, definitely, definitely look into chocolate. Um, I like everything that chocolate's doing the super forms amazing there is the whole deal with it being allelic with spot nose however the chocolate spot nose is an amazing combo so and i think that's even better um you know i just love everything chocolate's doing right now i'm, I'm working that into my dg clown dg pides all of those projects i think chocolate's amazing gene uh don't get overly attached to any one gene though i feel like I've had a lot of guys like, I'm only going to do this. You know, I'm going to work pies only or clowns only. I'm like, don't bury yourself into one project and, uh, and don't, you know, be open to, to, to some stuff. I, I have a, I have a buddy, Chris Jackson. He's going to watch this later. He hates clowns. <laughs> and then every now and then I'll show him a picture and he's like, I, I like that one. I like that one. But if he would have been more open to it and own one or two clowns, he would have been able to open, expand his projects out a little bit, you know? Um, so don't be so closed off where I have, I have guys where I'm like, oh, every animal in my collection needs to have NG. And I'm like, ah, that you limit yourself so much when you yeah. only revolve your whole collection around one type of gene. So kind of stay open minded, but don't, you know, don't go out there and collect every single thing, you know. Because there's some genes that don't work well with other genes, like we were exactly. talking earlier. Exactly. There's some genes where you want to not have it there in the combo. Right. Okay. Um, it's funny you bring up chocolate though, because I've got a pair of triple head chocolates. Well, actually, it's I've, it's a one point two uh, set. Um, it's a male. The male's chocolate, and one of the females is chocolate. But everything else, but it's all head uh, clown DG hypo. So I've got that stuff growing up. Did you get those for me? <laughs> no. Um, it's my buddy Mike that breeds boas. He uh, sold some of his uh, boa babies to somebody and basically had a line of credit essentially set up. And he got the, the set of triples, triple hets, uh, and he sent them over here to me to work the project for him. Okay, because I sold a set of those triple hats, chocolates too. And I was like, <laughs> that sounds familiar. 
<laughs> did, did, did they come to Pennsylvania by chance? <laughs> uh, I have to look that up. They very possibly <laughs> came that from would me. be that would be hilarious. Uh, I, was like, I sold chocolate triple heads. I was like, that sounds familiar. Yeah, no, it's it's a male, one male chocolate. I mean, and like I've never up until getting them, I never really paid much attention to chocolate. But dude, after they like when they had their first, first shed here, I opened up that tub. I was like, oh my god, that is a sexy looking snake. Like it, it was just phenomenal with how it looked. Someone says Absolutely. they're going to super chocolate hypo DGs. I, I've seen that animal as an adult, and it looks 10 times better than it does when it's a baby. And that's saying a lot for a ball python. Like the super yeah. chocolate hypo DG is an amazing, amazing animal. So I hope you hit I hope you hit that because that's it's such a nice animal. I don't, dude, I'm like I said, they should be ready to go hopefully this for 2024 season we'll see um whoever had them i don't know if uh i don't think they really fed them as often as they should have they were they kind of came kind of small for how old they were they had 2020s right uh i believe should be. they were either 20s or 21s they were 20s no they had to be 20s i know i produced they, them <laughs> it should have been i i don't think i i don't know he didn't say i don't he didn't give me a name as to who they came from yeah but i don't it's know okay. they came here a little on the smaller side yeah uh i sold him and again whatever he does uh, I, i've sold and it, it's like it's such a specific project right like such a specific pairing to make them but it's okay but Lindsay, don't feel bad. I've some so many people have suggested projects to me, and I will tell them I you know whatever. And in my head, I'm thinking that's stupid. I'm like I'm not gonna do that. And then I watch them go into fruition and make this animal, and I'm like I'm such an idiot. Like why didn't I do that? And one of the one of my biggest regrets was I actually had a breeder female desert ghost in my collection in 2014. And at the time, I was like, hey, I'm only, I'm, I bought this thing in. It looks like a hypo type thing. And someone was selling out of the industry and they just sold me this female. It was 300 bucks, $300 for a breeder female desert ghost. And um, at the time, I'm, I'm kind of new, right? 2014, I was kind of new. I was like, cool, I'll breed it to my spider pie. I was going to breed it yeah. to my spider pie. Yeah. Someone offered me $1,500 for it and I sold her. I was like, Eh, it's just a hypo, like some type of hypo animal. DG, that sounds stupid anyways, right? Desert Ghost, like that's two different genes into one name. That's stupid. Um, so for 1500 bucks, I sold off a Desert Ghost female that I could have made double hat DG pies for. In 2014, I would have been making visuals by 2016, and I would have been way ahead of the game. But instead, I paid $10,000 for a Desert Ghost pie male in 2018 instead. So that was my big regret. <laughs> What what do you think told me DG take so long to like kind of get so popular? Because um, I mean, yeah, it really, like when I first saw my first DG, like it glowed, like it just screamed to buy me, and I bought it. Right. So the DG did not take off for a number of reasons. First of all, the name. Okay. At the time of the when it came out, I I'll be honest. I said that's the dumbest name in the world. It's desert and goat. <laughs> And first of all, desert is already a death sentence because the pro exotic line of desert is infertile. And ghost, that's another gene already. You know, you're adding two genes that's become one name. Second of all, the gene was discovered by uh, the Bells down in uh, Naples, um, Reptile Industries. And they are not on Facebook. They're not on Instagram. They're not on any platforms. So they didn't push this project. It kind of just existed. Okay. And the third thing that hurt the gene when it came out is at the same time that DG was became a gene, you have bananas, sunsets, you got uh, clowns, you got all these things coming up. And all those things are very, very strong visual genes. Sunset is so extreme that everyone got in. And the scaleless, scaleless was also a big thing at the time. So everyone dumped into scaleless, uh, bananas, sunsets and all this stuff. Because DG's just looks like a nice hypo. It was a pretty hypo. 
And there wasn't a lot of pictures online of adult DG combos where people were, were thinking in their head, okay, ball pythons patch out beautiful and they age ugly. How can we fix that? No one thought that at the time. Everyone was just like, oh, I need to hatch out the very next banana because it's so extreme. It's easy to sell to new people. And I think those all those are all the factors that kind of hurt um, DG at first, which is actually perfect for the rest of us because we came in late and now we're all getting to kind of, uh, if not, all the DG combos would have already been made. So thank goodness. <laughs> all right. Now you and I were talking backstage a little bit. We're going to turn things up here a little bit, folks. Um, we're going to talk about two different topics here. One, we'll talk about shows and everything. But first, let's talk about, like, I know everybody knows I try to stay as much out of this drama thing in the industry as possible. Um, Bob, what's your thoughts on what's going on with this whole wreck in the industry at so, the moment. it's difficult for you to stay out of the drama because you, ha you have a podcast right you have a, a an, an audience and the audience wants to know right yeah and everyone here knows what, what we're talking about when we're talking about the drama in the industry right now everyone knows we're talking about the mj and sean bradley uh, i don't know what you call that um the only <laughs> the best way, if you don't know what's happening the best way to describe it would be 10th grade drama with WWE vibes. Um, two guys <laughs> calling each other out online. You already know 99.9% .9 of the chance nothing will happen. They can call each other whatever names they want. They're never going to meet up and fight because Sean's in a freaking wheelchair. Like it's, it's, it doesn't make any sense. <laughs> and um, again, I've known Sean for years. Me and Sean have had our incidents and we're good friends. I'm, I'm good friends with MJ. You know, so I, I don't take sides. I just think this is the dumbest thing that could happen in the industry. It makes us look childish. It makes us look immature. Um, when two of the guys that are are being viewed the most, right? MJ has thousands and thousands of, of, of viewers. And he's on here, um, you know, belittling someone in a wheelchair that's new to, uh, that's trying to come back into the industry. Sean... Sean, you, you, you're, you're better than this. You, you've been in the industry way too long. You should be able to ignore some of this stuff, but you didn't, I know. And some, and we just, for, for guys that are forefront of the industry, you, we need to be better than this. We need to uh, let that stuff slide. And for new people coming in and, and going, this is the, this is the industry. This is the industry we're in is two guys saying this Thursday on YouTube. I'm going to call it like, come on, dude. That's what WWE did. That's what they, <laughs> you know, I, at first I thought, okay, they're just trying to hype up views. But then I'm like, whoa, like we don't need that. Like, 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 like Lindsay said, we don't need to divide the industry and force people to pick yep. sides. And then you're having Chris Eaton post online. Oh, I'm a hundred percent on this side. And you're having guys post. I'm on this side. We don't need that. We all need to be on one side and fight the government because that's all they're trying to do is take away our rights to keep reptiles anyways. But instead, we're dividing within the community and fighting on YouTube. And I, I hate to say it because MJ is a grown ass man, but they don't go online and saying you're going to kick somebody's ass because you can blah, 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 all this stuff. Nothing happens. I've seen this in high school a gajillion times. Oh, I'm going to do it. nothing ever happens. So let's just let it all slide, you know, let's get over it and um, I don't know, hug it out or something or, or whatever they need to do to get over it because it makes the industry look immature. Yeah. I just like, I just don't see that there's a need because I know like it wasn't even just Sean, like he it turned into a whole crap yeah. storm with everybody. He right. like, I know he had even said about, you know, all these other podcasters are crap. Well, I don't think I have a crap show. I, mean, I don't right. have, you know, however that mil or however many thousands of followers that MJ has. Right. But I do enjoy my show. And I think, I mean, we've got 58 people here tonight, which I thank you everybody for tuning in tonight. I greatly appreciate it. Make sure you guys hit that subscribe button if you're new, please. But like, you know, everybody starts at different levels. You don't start at the top. Some people may not ever get to that level, but it doesn't mean that their shows are crap. 
I think it's a lot of it is attached to their ego, right? You got 5,000 subscribers. Now you're getting more people to view and you you start to think you have a lot of influence into the industry and, and, and stuff like that. It, you, they just have to understand that all they are is a vessel to, to a platform to share information. Okay. And to leave your ego aside and yeah, I get it. It's not like uh, they all, they're all different podcasters. It's not like I sit here and talk trash about other ball python breeders just because they breed ball pythons and say they're all trash. I'm the best. You know, yeah. like it, it, it you both, you all do the same thing. I get it. You interview the same people. You have a different type of interviewing process or whatever. But just because it's different doesn't mean it's better. You know, um, I, I've been on, I mean, eight, nine different type of these podcasts. And each one's different. Each vibe is different. You know, MJ's is a totally different vibe. You know, he's very high strung, you know, boom, 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 go, go, go. Um, this is more laid back. We're going to answer the questions and stuff like that. It's a different feel. But don't use this platform to attack somebody or don't use this platform to, you know, to, to make it, make yourself feel better and, and have viewers and, and make yourself more than what your platform is. You know, and uh, and a lot of times I think they forget that. And I think this is a really humbling experience for MJ, um, you know, with all that happened. And I think he'll grow from it. He'll learn from it. Um, and I would like it to see if, if they actually sat down together and did a real adult grown up interview with each other and, and actually get something done instead of this WWE crap. And um, and just. <laughs> You know, it's it's just not good. It's it's a terrible look for the industry overall, it is. especially for the new viewers. They're viewing and they're like, "This is what we're," you know, this and you know, especially. Can you imagine being some of these guys that dumped the hundred grand, two hundred grand into this, telling your wife, "Hey, I'm gonna get into this industry. It's cool." Blah 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 blah. And then that's what you sit and listen to at nine o'clock at night, you know, on a <laughs> Sunday, and you're like, "Is that guy, you know, yelling at a guy in a wheelchair?" I'm like, "Yeah, that that's happening right now." <laughs> No. It was uh, like I had to say, like I normally don't watch MJ. Just the it's his show just isn't my thing. I'm not gonna lie. His show just isn't my thing. But a couple of people that I'm friends with were telling me about what was going on. So it's like, all right, you know what? I've got to go back. Like my curiosity got the best of me. So I went back and I watched the replay of it. And like you said, like it's just like. Am I really watching this? All right. I was like, oh my god! And again, MJ or Sean could get mad at me for saying any of this. I, it's okay. They're again, like I said, nothing's gonna happen, right? They can say whatever. Nothing's actually gonna happen <laughs> unless, unless creative genetics, unless we did at the next Tinley show cage match. <laughs> <laughs> Man, I threw this idea out there. I threw that this idea out there ago. You donate five hundred dollars to USARC. You get to call out anybody you want in the industry, and if they want to avoid you in the match, they got to donate a thousand dollars to avoid you. That's uh, actually a good idea. Yeah, yeah, I think that's just asking for trouble, though. <laughs> well, uh, John Feely and Antoine did something similar. They did a um. A that match was, of some sort. I, I that yeah, that was kind of like an easygoing, kind of friendly, you know, friendly type deal. I want these guys to go in there and you know, <laughs> leave it all in the ring. You know, just leave it all out there. <laughs> Look, man, if you have that much to say online, say it in the ring. You know, and get it over with, and raise some money for you, Sark. <laughs> Ashley says, "Have Bob be the ref." In a single, <laughs> you know, I have to be the ref because uh, don't nobody want to see me in that ring. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see here. The chat is going crazy tonight, everybody. I want to thank you all for coming out and yeah, a bunch of losers at 9 30 on a Sunday. Geez, don't you guys have work in the morning, <laughs> dude? Like I told you backstage, like when I would when we would go for like three hours, dude, I would get to bed. Because nor you know we'd shut it down at like eleven. Then of course I'd be backstage talking with whoever was on for like another half hour or so. So it was like all but twelve o'clock till I actually got to bed. My ass would be dragging every Monday morning. <laughs> I'll tell you right like, now, I got oh. another thirty minutes in me, and that's about it before my wife yells at me. <laughs> hey, no, that's good, dude. That's good. 
Uh, Adam, what's up, dude? Thanks for tuning in. Adam, I'm glad you got your ultrasound working, brother. Uh, sorry I couldn't get to helping you out right away, but I'm glad you figured it out real quick. Um, congrats also on uh, what you found out. Football and ball pythons. Uh, let's see here. If anybody has any questions for Bob, just drop them in the uh, chat there. Drop them and in. We'll one. What's that? No, just drop the drop the questions and we'll get around oh. to it. We've been pretty good at that. Always a great show. Thanks for bringing. Thank you very much. I greatly appreciate all the support, everybody. Um, while we wait to see if there's any if people have any more questions or anything like that. Um, let's talk about shows and you're like, how many shows do you recommend doing a year? Um, big, small shows, you know, just your whole view and aspect on doing shows in general, or even like set it setups, like what you think people need to take into consideration when setting up for a show. All right. So uh, I'm going to answer this question real quick because I've had this question twice is what we do with our uh, our bedding. Uh, we put it on a spreader and spread it out. There's uh, my buddy has 200 acres of land. We just kind of spread it out and forget about it. But um, the with the shows, it's very difficult now. It's way different than when I got started, because when I got started, there was only one main circuit in southeast uh, U.S. is uh, Repticon. So I just did a bunch of Repticons. In 2017, 18, and 19, I did on every, those years, I did about 35 to 40 shows a year. I did like almost every other weekend, um, oh, wow. every other weekend plus, you know, so about three shows a month. That is so grueling and it will burn you out. I'll be honest. Um, it, it, it's, it's tough. But I did get my name out there uh, and I made good money. I averaged about $6,000 a show in 2018. And I was, I felt like I was on top of the world. I was crushing it. And um, the reason we backed off of shows is because obviously gas prices went up, hotel prices went up, table prices stayed the same. And we're looking at it and we're going, OK, what if we only did the big shows? We only did the major shows. And so we swapped over to that model. Um, this in 2023, I have 15 shows booked. That's between all of the rept um, reptilian nation shows that are uh, close to me. I say close 12 hours. Um, so I'll, I'll drive all the way to Houston um, and I'm doing all the NARBCs and the Daytona NARBE or NARE, whatever the, the acronym is, um, and, and the Nashville Pet Expo. Um, right now, the, the reason we're, we're skipping around to that is I would like my average per show to go up, obviously, um, and, and cut the cost. There's no reason to do a back to back to back to back shows and average you know two thousand dollars a show when you can just do one show for ten thousand because um you have way less cost you have way less travel way less wear and tear in your body and the animals um so pick out the best shows in your area um the one way to do that is basically just message the people you know that are that are vending that show and ask them for the turnout you know message people you trust um I'm going to do a quick plug here for my Patreon is that uh, we post all of our sales number in our Patreon. Um, so you'll know exactly what my sales number is per show. Uh, and, and a lot of our other Patreon members, Brian Carter and, and Josh will post their numbers of when they vend. So you can kind of pick and choose and can't, you know, and drop the shows that you don't think are worthy. Again, don't drive seven hours to make 800 bucks. It, it doesn't make yeah. any sense. And when you're saying, oh, I'm, I just want to get my name out there. Well, if there's only 200 people through the door and you already know 100 of them, it doesn't help you to drive seven hours to do to lose money. So I will let you know or if you can message me directly and, and, and say, hey, is this show worth doing? If I've done it before, I'll give you my, my honest review. Um, in my opinion, if you're going to travel for a show, you need to see 2,500 people. 2,000 to 2,500 people should be your minimum if you're traveling because – um, you, you have to give yourself a chance to make money and you have to give yourself a chance to make money after the show by seeing enough people. Um, don't burn yourself out doing 30, 40, 50 shows a year. I, I have friends that do that, you know, and they get so burnt out. They don't even want to talk to customers when people come up and say, can I hold the snake? And they just say no straight up. I, I rarely <laughs> say no. Yeah, I rarely say no. I'll be honest. People are still surprised. I if you come and ask me to hold a snake, if a kid come and ask me to hold a snake, you're gonna hold a snake. Um, if yeah. if you guys paid forty bucks to get into a venue and um, 
and you don't get to hold a snake, I, I feel like you you missed out on the experience of going to a show. You know, I feel like if a family pays, you know, 40, 50 bucks to get into a show, their kids should be holding a snake, you know, um, and 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 that is so important in growing our industry is like a vendor just treat these people like they actually spent money to be here. And that kid's going to have a good experience. He's going to go to school and tell their friends about this reptile show that they got yep. to hold a drag bearded dragon or a snake or whatever. And then the next time the show comes around, their friends will come out and they'll come back out there. And maybe they didn't buy a snake from you, but they'll remember you and they'll come back out. Now they did some research or whatever, and they'll buy a snake from you, or they just had a good time. And they'll bring in you know more of their friends. And I feel like that's a way we grow our community, not just by spamming shows in every every corner of the country. It's by having good quality experiences. These kids that go to these shows need to have a good experience with that with that show. Just because they came to the show doesn't mean you grew the industry. They have to come to the show and have a good experience so that they can tell their friends about it. The same thing when you sell a snake. You sell a kid a snake and that snake dies in a month. You have ruined not only ruined that experience for reptile keeping for that kid, but all of his friends. Because he told all of his friends he bought a snake. You know, every kid who buys a snake tells all their friends about it. And then a month later, and then the, his friends are like, hey, what happened to your snake? And they're like, oh, it died because reptile breeders sell me, uh, you know, sick animals or whatever. So I think that's that experience is so important for growing the industry. Um, blah, blah, blah. Beast here. Well, everybody that dropped some questions before this, I do have them start. So I don't think I skipped them. Fine, this just fine. fit in at the moment with the topic, because this was even something I wanted to ask. What do you, what do you do for mite prevention during the show? And what do you do as far as like, I'm going to say quar like quarantining after show practices with all your snakes and stuff, just to help prevent spreading anything to, the collection at home so i used to spray preventamite on my tablecloths at the show i get to show and i spray preventamite before i put my animals out i used to do that and i got in trouble um i had a roach breeder across the hall for me cuss me out that i that i was trying to kill his roaches um <laughs> <laughs> but um so now, yeah i was like oh god i didn't i didn't realize i was killing all his roaches uh, now what we do is, uh, well, first of all, Bob buys a whole table block. So that is true. <laughs> I usually buy a whole island to prevent having other vendors near me. I hate having people I don't know near me. I'll vend next to guys I know and like. I hate having a, a random vendor near me because you never know, right? But uh, so our baby room is separated from our adult room. It's actually about 50 feet away. It's, it's a good walk away. Okay. Um, and then when we bring babies back, we roll everything into the baby room. We will unload all the babies into the racks and everything gets dipped in fripronil mix. Uh, fripronil is the active ingredient for um, frontline flea spray. Um, and I actually did my research, uh, not research, but my own experiment. It, back in March, after a show, I had gotten mites. I came home and there's some of the babies had mites on them. So I picked these mites off and uh, I would drop one in some... Um, Permethrin, and I'll drop one in fripronil, and then I'll drop one in a uh, preventamite uh, treated tub. And fripronil killed the mites the fastest and guaranteed. So I ended up using fripronil. We got rid of all the mites that we got from that from that show within a few days. Uh, we haven't uh, using fripronil as a preventative since then. We have never gotten mites again. Um, I come home, animals get dunked, boom boom, right into their tub. And the next week we spray everything down because we have to give you have to give your animals enough time to settle in. You don't want to do too much treatment all at once. It will freak them out. So I dunk all my animals, spray, boom, and then everything's done. Again, I don't do a show every single weekend, so it's a little bit easier to, to go through that. But if you're doing a show every weekend, you have to change that up and kind of uh, come up with your own little preventative thing. Now, where do you, where can you get that, uh, fripronil or however you say, um, it? I will send you a link later. I think you can just, you can Google fripronil concentrate and they'll come up with the, the giant okay. jug. You need, you need, do need to dilute that out. By the way, I dilute mine out, uh, one cup per two gallons. And I go with the two gallon because mine is a two gallon pump sprayer. I spray directly okay. on the bedding and everything. Yeah. And it, no effects at all on the snakes or anything. It's. I have never, so I've seen ill effects on, um, uh, using, um, permethrin, but I've not seen any ill effects from Fripanil. Okay. Awesome. See, 
that's something where it's always been a worry for me because I've only done two shows so far. And it was one of those things where, like you said, like you said earlier, you know, kids come up and they will ask to see a snake. I, I don't want to be the guy that says, no, you can't hold a snake. Right. Because one, I've sold a snake. Actually, I sold a couple of snakes because kids came up. They wanted to hold the snake. And then they worked on mom and dad the rest of the show. And mom and dad came back at the end of the show and got the snake. Because you because you um, were that guy. Because yeah. you were that guy to let him hold the snake. Right. And it's like like you said, they paid to get in. One, it, you know, it brings it might bring in somebody else to the hobby. It makes them think of me, at least in my opinion, it makes them think of me as, hey, he's a nice guy, you know, he's down to earth. He left the kids hold the snakes, you know, all that good stuff. Uh, I don't. <laughs> I, don't I honestly you... don't. I think. Uh, oh, I'll have to look that label <laughs> up. Um, uh, how long? How do I quarantine? Um, so it depends. I haven't bought a snake from too many breeders this past year. Um, so it, it, it's it's a little bit different. Uh, I just put it in a separate rack and. Basically, when you're quarantining, you're only looking for mites or respiratory infection. Um, so if you know what you're looking for, it's, it's a little bit easier. Um, I would suggest a 30 day quarantine or quarantining period. A lot of people online are like, oh, I quarantine everything for 90 days. I can guarantee you 90 percent of those people are not. Um, the 90 day quarantine is such a long quarantine. I don't even know what you're looking for in 90 days. You can tell the snake has respiratory infection within a few days. And you can tell it has mites within a few minutes. Um, so I don't even know what else you're looking for. Um, everything else you would need a fecal sample for, you know, like if you're looking for bugs or anything like that. Um, so you go longer than 30 days, you're not going to find out any more information than you would have gone for 90 days. So, All right. I want to get back to the show thing, but I want to answer these three questions just in case these people have to hop off or whatever. Um, old man pies and clowns wants to know, Bob, got a female to all 1200 grams, just went off food for the last month. Any suggestions on how to get her to start eating again? Okay, so this could happen for a few reasons. If it's an older female, let's say three, four years old, um, throw a male in there. <laughs> I'll just be honest. But if it's a young female where she's hit the thousand gram wall, if you will, um, try this. Um, put a male in a bag, tie the bag up, and then throw that male in, in there. He will try to breed her. He can't because he's in a bag. Uh, she will think he's breeding her and think that she needs to develop, and that will automatically trigger a feeding response, usually. But if, if that doesn't work, just put her in the smallest tub you can find that she can actually fit in, and uh, that usually works. All right. That's the second time I've heard the thing about the snake in a bag thing. So uh, put a male in a bag. Okay. So obviously you don't you don't want that female. If she's young, right? She's let's say she's 18 months old. You don't want her to breed because she's too small and, and, and immature to breed or whatever. So that male being in a bag would trigger a breeding response without actual breeding. Okay. Yeah. See, see, now this is some words neat because I'm I hear two different sides of the whole breeding thing. Um, like Austin uh, says about you know if they hit that twelve hundred grand like that eleven twelve hundred grand mark. He says, you know, hey, give it a shot. Throw a male in and see what happens. That's fine. Right. Um, again, it needs uh, to see the different uh, the, the, the different thought processes. That's I mean, that's this is actually comparing apples to oranges when I say this. But just because a 10 year old girl, human girl can get pregnant doesn't mean she should, you know, True. Uh, in my opinion. Um, so I don't like breeding 1200 gram females unless they're old. You know, you every now every Big collection has a four, you know, 12, 13, 1400 gram, four year old female. Then, yes, if she's old, yes, she can breed. But because it's just a small snake, there are big people, small people, big snake, big, uh, small snakes. That 1200 gram female, that's, you know, I can get a female to 1200 grams in like less than a year. You know what I'm saying? You can get them to 1200 grams in a year or less. That doesn't mean you should breed them. They're not sexually mature. Their body is not ready. You're going to breed them young and then you're going to lose their maximum growth potential because now they're going to they're not going to get to that 2,000, 2,500 gram range because you bred them at 1,200 grams. And I, I just don't like that, that, that idea of breeding okay. a 1,200 gram animal. Okay. See, so this is why I love having different breeders on because you get to see different perspectives how everybody does everything. it. Right. Right. Uh, Eric from Drop Time here wants to know, in your opinion, what should someone starting out invest in animals or infrastructure as like racks and stuff? 
Um, obviously, both would be the right answer here. Once you've already established good animals and good amount of animals, let's say you have 50 animals, um, that's a good time to start transitioning to, to investing in your infrastructure. First of all, good incubator. Um, again, you don't have to go and spend a bunch of money, just a stable incubator that you can build yourself or whatever. Um, good thermostats and good racks. Uh, you'd be surprised how how well um, a good rack will help you breed. Um, uh, you know, poor, poorly designed rack or poorly built rack will stick. You're shoveling the rack like this. Water splashing everywhere. Your heat's not consistent. Um, your airflow is not consistent. Stuff like that. And then the one thing I hate seeing is people buying cheap thermostats from Amazon that um you know it's like a 40 dollars thermostat and you're plugging it into a rack with ten thousand dollars worth of animals and uh, yeah, they'll lose all their animals because the probe burned out and you're thinking in your head you just risk ten thousand dollars worth of animals on a 40 dollars thermostat you know so don't cut corners on the thermostat part but i really do think uh after you've established enough animals in my opinion it'll be about 50 animals a good solid foundation of animals then um you do need to invest in your infrastructure but don't go out there and buy ten thousand dollars worth of racks and don't have good animals to put in them you know yeah everybody quick little plug uh if anybody feels so willing and generous any super chats goes towards just feeding the snakes all that good stuff so don't be afraid to drop a super chat or anything like that um all the support's greatly appreciated uh let's see we just had a couple more questions come in here balls deep wants to know what do you do for a male breeder dropping off feed during breeding um i've gotten a little bit better uh about growing my males bigger now for before i start them uh, so even if they drop feed uh, as long as that male is feeding at least once a month i'll continue to breed them if he goes a full month without eating, I will cut his breeding uh, and then I will move him to a smaller tub. I have these 50 series tubs from ARS with a hide built into it, and those generally uh -huh. do the job. Um, I sling them into one of those. They usually get back on eating pretty quick. As long as they're not seeing a female every week, they usually get back on feeding. Awesome. Uh, Jaffe has a question. Any tips on getting males to breed for you? Um, so I've, I have a few different things I try with young, um, usually younger males, like under two years old. And if they're not breeding well, um, a few things you can try, obviously placing him in with another male, get his testosterone, I guess, going, um, you can try, uh, popping another, this is gross. You can pop a ma another male and smear the sperm plugs onto the female's backs. This works. Okay. It's a little gross. You have to scrub the. <laughs> You know, take the sperm plugs <laughs> off another male and put it on that female's back. Put that male in there. He would usually get him going. Um, this trick here is like last resort. I do this for some animals. I will put them in a bag and I'll take them for a ride and they'll cool them off. Even if I'm going to the gym for an hour, I just leave them in the car. Um, and it's cool outside. It's comfortable outside. Obviously, if it's not, as long as it's not hot outside. Uh, winter yeah. time is a good time to do it. 60 degrees outside, I'll take them for a ride, leave them in a bag, leave them in the car while I'm at the gym. Comes back, throw them in there, they're usually locked up. Um, again, keep an eye on your animal, make sure they're healthy weight um, and, and all that. Because a lot of these males, if they're too young, I, I'm watching way too many people try to breed 400 gram males. And it's, it's uh, there are people, a lot of people are killing their animals. So that's one thing I don't think some people re actually realize that all pythons will breed themselves to death they will, <laughs> like, they will kill themselves yeah yeah it's it's no joke they will do it i mean i've luckily not had that experience but i've heard plenty of people that have had i'll it. be honest i've done it i'll be i'll be honest I, you know like um uh, this is just experience to give to new breeders uh I, I got very in a quick of a hurry back then i was like oh i need to get this male breeding i need to make my money back out of this project I kept throwing this male in. I'm like, ah, you know, it's okay. He's only skipped feed for six weeks. He's still healthy. Let's throw him back in. Let's throw him back in. Let's throw him back in. He needs to keep breeding. And this male locks every time. So I'm thinking he's healthy. He's he's breeding every time I'm throwing him in there. And they just keep losing weight, losing weight, losing weight. And you're like, oh, crap. Now I need to get him back feeding. So I stopped breeding him. But then it's too late, you know. So keep an eye on those animals. These are living animals. I mean, I get it. We invest a lot of money into them. But uh, what's the youngest I've got a male to breed? Again, like I said, when I was when I was first starting out and uh, I was in a quick and a hurry, I got 400, 450 gram males to lock up and they were sire clutch before they hit 500 grams. 
Um, it's not a good way of doing it. Uh, right now, we don't even start our males until they're 700 grams. You know, I want to get okay. 700 grams healthy. They have I lived through a winter. Um, they've been through one winter at least and and, and mature enough and their hemipenes are mature. I, I, it's gross to say it like this, but when you pop a grown, like a mature male, you know, his hemipenes look mature. <laughs> You, you yes. know what I'm saying? Uh, <laughs> he looks like he's ready to breed. Um, and some of these young males, man, you push them and then they go off feed. You're going to end up losing the season anyways. You know, that's what I've learned. It's like, yeah, you'll get a clutch out of them at 400 grams. And then he breeds one female and then he's done for the year. You're going to end up losing the season on him. He's skinny. You're sitting here rehabbing him for the next eight months. Uh, it's just not worth it. Yeah. Uh, B says, do you drop temps or temp cycle at all? I do not. Uh, I, I run the exact same temperatures all year. Um, every winter, there'll be a week or two weeks where we have a very warm week, like 75, 70 degrees outside. We, that was our last week. I left the doors wide open. Uh, I leave the doors wow. open. Um, we get the, the very ambient, nice temperature swing inside. It just happens to be raining also. And every single one of my males locked up. I went and paired all my males and they were all locked up. Um, I feel like that natural air in the winter time, uh, just kind of helps. And a lot of our females went from 12 to 20 millimeters within two to three weeks, um, after that oh, nice wow. little air exchange. Yeah. So we get a lot of females to develop that way. Um, and if you're having a nice, nice day out, uh, depending on where you are, especially Florida, if it's 75, 70 degrees out, just leave the windows open, let some fresh air come out. And especially if it's raining, you get that nice rain coming in, these males are ready to breathe. So that's one thing I try to like if I see that there's a front moving through because up here in PA, PA, I mean, like right now it's a little too cold to just open up the window that I have here. Um, but when you know those fronts are coming through, even if I don't have a pairing that's not due for like a week or two, throw them in. I'll, I'll, I'll jump start it. I'll throw that mail in when that front's coming through because that front, I mean, they know. Right. You they really can, so they can feel the air pressure. Um, yep. So when people are like, oh, why are you like if I, I usually pair all my males on Tuesday, but if I look on the, the, the weather on the forecast and it's going to rain Wednesday or Thursday, I wait. I wait an extra day to catch the rain because I I'll usually pair Tuesday and I remove all my males by Friday. But if it's raining on Friday, I'm going to pair on you know Thursday and remove them Saturday or Sunday, something like that. Just kind of just work around that a little bit heard of the hydro project a couple of times how do you think this project will develop in the future i'll be honest with you the main reason i bought into this project was because my buddy dave levinson sent me pictures and he said get into this project and the very next week uh, i heard news that justin kabilka bought a hydro combo and i i went out and bought the 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 mail um anytime justin buys an animal it's kind of a good sign that the project is he sees life in the project and i hate to be that guy that just ride his coattails but Again, good business decision. Uh, watch watch the guys that are that are leading the industry, and you know, kind of pull the strings on the on, on the industry and and see where that's going. You know, um, and again, I, I see potential in the project. It's just I actually wasn't very educated on it when it first came out. I overlooked it, and my buddy Dave was like, "Look into this project. You don't want to miss out." And sure enough, Justin picked one up, and I grabbed the very next one that was available. Nice. That's something I'm gonna have to look look into. I've never heard of it, so I'm curious to see what it actually looks like. Right. It's it's uh I'll, I'll try to post a picture of my mail. Um, you know, sometimes. Okay. No, that that'd be awesome, dude. Um, with back to the show thing, I know we completely took a big right turn. Yeah. What are you using for like your betting for your displays? Um, so in my displays, I use all ARS displays. And then in the in the bedding, I've tried everything. I've actually even used leather sheets in there before. And that was a probably the biggest waste of money I used. Um, I use Alpha Dry. It's uh, basically chopped up compressed cotton. In case they okay. poop or pee, it's very absorbent. It's not as dusty as like um, Aspen or something like that. I've seen people use Aspen. I don't think it's a good look. Um, Alpha Dry is the cleanest. Um, best look for your animal in my opinion it's white it's it's crystal clean it's when you put the animals on there as soon as they poop it absorbs it up it's just a good look overall in my opinion for shows it's, it's the aesthetic that i want again people i tell people go for what you like to look at a lot of people use a black background because it looks good on their snake that's perfectly fine i again like my my snake room is crystal white my displays i want white background for all my animals i want the brightest white light i can get 
Um, so the hundred percent depends on the look that you're going for. I've seen a lot of different looks and a lot of them I like, and then some of them I look at and I go, do not do that. Um, back then when I first started, I seen guys use marbles. It's fine. It looks kind of cool, but you know how hard it is to clean marbles when <laughs> inside a display and a snake just totally blows it up, you know? So that's that, that, and I was like, Ooh, I want ease of cleaning. Uh, have you ever seen me at a show before I bring a shop back with me? If it poops, I just go in, chop back all of it out, and dump new bedding in. You know, so oh, okay. uh, just uh, uh, for me, efficiency uh, it, it is the key. Just like down there in the snake room, efficiency. I want people. I want us to be able to clean quickly. That way, we clean more often. Things that are more efficient, easier to do, you're gonna do it more often. If it's hard to clean, I'm I'm gonna be lazy and not do it. You know, so I want things to be easy to do. What are you? With the cleaning thing, what are you using for bedding in, like, in the shop and stuff? Oh, so I use uh, Pro Coco. I've been with them for a long time. I've been with them before these Coco Wars started between <laughs> like all these companies. Um, but I use Pro Coco, um, and we, I have uh, my my house is on nine acres, so we just drive back there with the Kubota and we just dump the cocoa into a, a hole somewhere. Um, okay. and it's very simple. Um, and we we just, uh, for cleaning, we just use bleach. It's a bleach mix, uh, with water and we just, uh, scrub the tubs that way. Uh, my buddy, Chris, he works here with us and his son is our, our actually tub scrubber. And he just goes through all the tubs. He goes through about 500 tubs a week and he zooms through them. Uh, we got a few more minutes. So I'm going to use this opportunity to give our patron between me and Josh Lumberg a uh, quick shout out. Uh, yeah, go our, ahead, dude. Our Patreon is uh, Bob's Ball Shed on Patreon website. Um, we're having a really good time in there with our members. Um, what we do in there is, is a little bit different than the other Patreons is any money you spend in the Patreon is yours. You just store it in credit. So you just claim it back when you buy a snake from us. Uh, we give away $1,000 a, a month in um, freebies. Uh, basically, we do a raffle. I mean, a drawing, basically. It's no, you, it's included in your Patreon membership. We just pick a member and they get a $500 credit with me and then $500 credit with Josh. Um, every show we take Patreon members to shows with us and show them the ropes and um, give them like the VIP treatment, if you will, and all the time. And uh, we give away a lot of tax info, breeding info, um, show info. Uh, we're a hundred percent transparent with our show info. Um, I feel like, the, the members get a lot out of that. Um, so just so they know, um, okay, th these are the numbers these guys are hitting and they're selling these type of animals at these type of shows and how to achieve that. But again, just a quick plug for our Patreon. What do you have different levels to your Patreon or is it just kind of like I do. one level? I do. I, I, we have three different tiers for the Patreon. However, um, no one signed up for the first tier. I feel like uh, I don't know if I didn't put enough perks in that first tier or just everyone wanted the other tiers. Again, every, all your money that you spend goes into credit. So I guess spending, you know, like not a lot of money, it, it takes forever to build credit. Um, the bulk of our Patreon members are $50 and the $100 a month tier. Um, okay. With that, again, you have direct access to us. Again, I answer questions pretty well anyways when people message me on Instagram or Facebook. But you also have uh, access to us with the Discord. Um, and you'll get, I, we do a, um, I, I do a daily uh, deals type thing on Patreon. So I'll just pick a random animal and I'll just cut the price for the Patreon members. Um, so we do kind of a daily deal situation. And then uh, Josh makes it a lot of fun uh, between me and Josh. We make it a lot of fun. And then we're doing like a Patreon vacation in, um, I think we're choosing either Mexico or Jamaica. We haven't decided yet. Um, we're going to do a, a vacation for everybody um, in April. Oh, wow. Um, the cost uh, for creative genetics uh, for or for anybody that's interested, the cost is uh, whatever tier you choose. Is it be uh, twenty five dollars, fifty dollars, or a hundred dollar tier? Um, you'll still have access to us uh, on every Tuesday. I ID everybody's clutches. Um, you just post it in, or you send it to me directly, and I ID I help you ID your clutch to the best of my ability. Or Josh, or or, or one of the other Patreon members will help you out. Um, and yeah, tax info is something a lot of people need to hear about. Yes, tax info is so important because when I first got started, I didn't know any of this. And I was asking all the OGs about it, and none of them would tell me. And then I find out it's because none of them are paying taxes. Um, and the difficulty, <laughs> of not, the difficulty of not paying taxes is that 
you can't buy anything. You know, you know how hard it is to go buy a car and you made $20,000 last year is impossible. So I teach you the ways of uh, how I handle my, my side of the taxes, what my accountant tells me to do and stuff like that, or what I feel is, is, is the best way for me personally in my situation to do the taxes. Um, what best way to get your tax exemptions and your uh, deductions, um, your donations and, and how to handle all of your um, all of your expenses when you buy racks, how to expense your racks or a vehicle even. Um, uh, Patreon channel. Uh, the Patreon is on um, the Patreon website. If you go to Patreon website and you search uh, look for us up, it's a uh, Bob's Ball Shed. And then it'll, it'll show up our thing and you can click on that and you just message us and we'll add you into the Discord. But yeah, the tax thing is so important because there, there's things that school should have taught you but didn't, right? When like basically, why should you buy a van? Why should you buy a transit van? Uh, well, because it weighs 6,060 pounds. Well, what, are that, what does that mean for your business? That means you can expense all of that off in one year because it weighs over 6,000 pounds. That's not something the general public knows. You know, that's stuff we can share with you guys because my accountant told me that. My accountant said, when you go buy a vehicle for this business, make sure it weighs over 6,000 pounds. Uh, stuff, you know, small stuff like that. And uh, the, what counts as deductions? What can you de uh, deduct? Can you deduct a clown pie that you bought? Or can you deduct a rack? And how many years can you deduct the rack? You know, when you buy racks from ARS, make sure you keep the receipt so that you can deduct it over many, many years. Um, I am not an LLC. I am going to be an LLC this year. Um, I wasn't an LLC because it wasn't necessary at the time. But now that we have employees and, and stuff like that, there's more liability. Um, for anyone that's not uh, aware, LLC is uh, limited liability so that when someone sues you, because let's say someone trips and falls in your facility or something like that, and if they sue you, they don't sue you, Bob Vu, they sue Bob's balls. And so let's say they sue Bob's Balls for a million dollars uh, and they win the suit. Well, Bob's Balls might have to go out of business, but Bob Vu does not. Right. I don't go out. I don't have to go sell my car to pay this guy. Um, so my um, if, if for those that don't know, I own a, a nail salon. Uh, our nail salon has to be on an LLC in case someone trips, falls and breaks their neck in my nail salon. They don't sue me. They do. They sue the nail salon, which has its own insurance for those purposes. You're writing off animal purchases with depreciation or keeping them as inventory. Um, there's a few ways of doing this. Um, again, we'll discuss all this in the Patreon. However, I'm going to answer that question real quick. Um, you can do it either way. Now, ball pythons doesn't count like livestock, like when you're buying a cow or a breeding a breeding bull or something like that. Um, so the deductions a little bit different. In my suggestion, your best bet is to uh, to register the animal as inventory and you can continue to roll that inventory over year and year and year let's say you pay ten thousand dollars for that snake he becomes inventory for the following year and then the following year because you still have him because you have not sold him so you still have that inventory that rolls over to the next year because you bought inventory um because you that you don't want to use him as the, uh, as an asset that loses value over time because that animal is still worth ten thousand dollars if you're still breeding him that next year next year next year next year however you haven't sold him yet okay because eventually you plan to sell him so he is inventory um but you can continue to roll that inventory into the next year and next year and next year okay so guys now, um, it is now 10 you've got my wheels turning now you've got my wheels turning and i'm gonna have to check out the your uh, patreon thing because i was on billy's patreon and i kind of got to where i wasn't getting what i needed out of it but what you were just going over is the crap that i need to hear and have access to just because this year i'm looking at getting my llc done so it's all okay so i'm just going to show you guys a little bit because um uh, not Billy specifically. I feel like uh, they t mentioned this on a few different Patreons um, that they weren't getting what they, they thought they were going to get out of the Patreon. They're just paying this money for information and then they just re gets repetitive. Um, but with us, even if we do get repetitive, which I try not to, um, you're still going to roll credit with us. Right? Like you spend $1,200 a year with us. You just go pick a snake out from, from my morph market and you get that snake. Uh, I'm just going to show you real quick here. We have so many different channels. On what we um, we run through, uh, enclosures, rack setup, husbandry, pairing, uh, community availability. Here's uh, show Q and A tips. 
uh, tax information and record keeping, social media lists and, and all of that. The show report. Uh, I'm going to give you the quick run on the show report. Show the, the show report here is when I, me, oh, Jesus, I'm so bad at this. Uh, so this is me explaining what we did at this show, how much money we made at this show, what type of inventory we sold. Um, each one of these is the show report. This is from Josh. He types, we type up a very complete list of how we do at these shows, what inventory, how much of each inventory, so that you know when you go to this type of show, a pet show or a, an ARBC, what type of inventory is moving. Um, the reason that's also important is it keeps the members motivated, right? Uh, people hear all the time, oh, this guy's making $30,000, $40,000, $50,000 at a show. Is it real, right? People don't know, like, is that a real thing? So when I post in there, okay, we, I'll be honest with everybody here. Well, uh, Tin Lee in October was our best show ever. And I posted the number into the Patreon and I broke down our sales. This was our most expensive animal. This was the cheapest animal we sold. And this was the volume we sold per day. So that you know that all these stuff, this stuff actually happens and what type of inventory is selling at the time. If I join, do I get access to all the past posts? Yes, you do. As long as you keep scrolling, all of that gets saved. Uh, any information you need, you can go to the search search bar and it'll show up uh, all the information you need. And again, if you have questions, you can re-ask those same questions. It's perfectly okay. Um, new members ask the same questions and it's okay. It's, again, you, you're paying for our time. So I will answer questions a hundred times. It doesn't matter. So I'm going to check that out, dude, because that, yes, that there interests me. I'm going to be checking that out and you're probably going to be getting a new member out of it. <laughs> I appreciate that. So, all right. We are like, I appreciate you going a little bit past the two hour mark, Bob. I really do. Everybody, I want to thank each and every one of you for all the support and for tuning in with us. I want to thank real quickly our sponsors tonight. Chris from BNS Reptilia. Go check Chris out if you need cocoa, like cocoa to go. Um, any ball pythons, blood pythons, colubrids, pine snakes, bull snakes. He's got it. Check him out. And Nathan from Infant Possible Pythons. Nathan, thank you so much for sponsoring this. Give me uh, uh, one more minute here. So there's a lot of people are asking about the Patreon. I was so anti Patreon for the longest. I'm like, people shouldn't have to pay me for my time and knowledge because the, I got that knowledge for pretty much free. However, when Josh looked at my phone when we're at a show together and he goes, how many people send you questions on ID and stuff a day? And it's probably on average about five to six people ask me to ID clutches a day. And I always do it. And he goes, how much time do you spend about 20, 30 minutes a day ID and stuff for, for people? And um, he was like, you need to, you know, categorize this. So I was like, I need to do this on one day, Tuesday. Boom. That's usually when we ID stuff. So we kind of squeeze this all into one platform. And we're like, well, I don't want to charge people for our time. That's why we did it to where all the money goes towards credit for animals. That way, this Patreon isn't for everybody. I don't want everybody to join it. I just want our current customer base that already like us and spend money with us to get benefit from this. That way, they're going to get snakes from us anyway. So if they're going to spend money with us anyways. Just send it to us monthly, and then boom, you get to pick out your snake, and you get all these perks with it. So that's what the reason we started doing the Patreon. I was actually anti-Patreon for a while, too. I thought it was the dumbest thing in the world. See, dude, you've, uh, the, just the information you stated that you're giving out is well worth it. Um, that's more than what... Uh, then what I, I was getting, uh, like I said, in Billy's, I also ran into a time thing where I couldn't, like his lives, I just couldn't make uh, catching his live Q&As anymore. And like you say, it got a little bit repetitive. Um, but no, I'm definitely going to check yours out, Bob, because that is stuff there that I like to have access to. So I appreciate you plugging that in there. Uh, looks cool. like you, thank you, you guys. You might I will, uh, if anybody have... has any questions, feel free to message me. You guys know how to find me on Instagram and Facebook. Um, we appreciate you guys' time and uh, your, your time for interviewing me. And uh, let me know when um, we want to do this again in case, I mean, we can always uh, schedule a second second interview. Dude, that would be awesome. I'm pretty sure everybody would enjoy that as well. Thank you, Bob. Appreciate that, bro. Yeah, um, no But yeah, everybody, we're going to cut it off. Uh, let Bob have a little bit of evening time with his family and everything. Thank you so much for all the support. Next week's guest, everybody, is Jim and Angie of Jar Pythons. 
Um, that's going to be a great live as well. Everybody knows Jim and Angie from JAR just because of those amazing egg cutting boards that you can see there in the back. Barely see it, but it's back here. That's one of the big things that they're known for is that all just that amazing craftsmanship that they do with that, along with some awesome snakes that they produce. So definitely don't miss that. Um, also, this week's video, I don't even know what I, it's on yet. I had like, I've, I'm still working through the, all the stuff I have pre-filmed. It's just a matter of what kind of, what mood I'm in and what do I end up picking. I also, it, it might even be the uh, clutch pulling of cl our first clutch of the season. So we'll have to see if she drops tomorrow like she's supposed to. If she does, it might be the first clutch pulling of the season for this week. So we'll see. But everybody, again, thank you so much for all the support. Phil, thank you again, brother, for the super chat. I really appreciate it. And I'll catch you guys next week. Take care. Later. Right, thank you guys.